what happens when you're trying to hang your furniture on the ceiling, but it won't work. Interlinked. Interlinked. Ma! The meatloaf! Interlinked. Interlinked. What happens when you find mashed potatoes in a cave? Why is it there? Interlinked. Interlinked. In an eating contest, how many hot dogs can you eat? Interlinked. Interlinked. What happens when you drive to the grocery store, but your spot is taken by that old lady? Interlinked. Interlinked. I saw a ghost last night. It was a naked dog. Interlinked. Interlinked. Your mother drives you to the market, grabs a baby. Interlinked. Interlinked. Idiot says interlinked. Yeah. In- interlinked. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was good. Welcome to Franchise Killer. This is a podcast where we pick movie franchises or wannabe franchises, review them film by film, and see where things went wrong or right. Interlinked. Interlinked. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Reese, the host of this podcast. You are... David. You are... Irina. And you are... Blade Runner number 41. <laughs> and way off in a distant land, we have... AJ. Today we're talking about Blade Runner 2049. Oh, man. Released in... 2017. Oh, is that what? What'd you watch, AJ? I was so close this time. Is it, <laughs> almost dead. This is the Maze Runner. I thought you said Maze Runner. Oh, oh runner. no! Runner. Oh god! Blade Runner, Maze well, Runner. You might. You, who knows? We watched it 2049 times. <laughs> How ironic! I'm just so crazy right now. I need oh, to work on my notes, or you need to work on your uh, observation skills. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so this movie came out in 2017. It's directed by Denis Villanueva. I'm pretty sure that's right. Uh, even though we were watching the extras and a couple of people said Dennis and a couple of people said Denis. Pretty sure it's Denis. So I'm going to go with Denis. He's directed Incendies, Prisoners, Enemy, Sicario, and Arrival, along with a couple of other films uh, way earlier in his career. The movie stars Ryan Gosling, Harrison Ford, Ana de Armas, Sylvia Hoax, Robin Wright, Mackenzie Davis, Dave Batista, and Jared Leto. Yes, and the movie was written by Hampton Fancher, who was also um, also wrote the first one. So wow, that's, I didn't know that until yep. this episode. That's really cool. Mm-hmm. Until he just said it. Yeah, and Michael Green. But oh yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so on this podcast, we first go over our thoughts on the film before revisiting it for the episode. Then we dive into the story, break it down bit by bit, and talk about the more significant moments. Then towards the end of the show, we give our brief reviews and numbered scores, along with an analysis on the health of the franchise and whether or not this film hurt it. So, had y'all seen Blade Runner 2049 before this episode? David? I may have seen it once or twice. Maybe? Interlinked? Interlinked. (laughs) It was uh, probably about a year ago, actually, when you first made me watch this, Reese. You always make it sound like... I'm strapping you to a chair and just like okay, you are, you, you you are might watching as well. Okay, you're strapping David, but he likes it. Wait, I, I <laughs> he did that to me, but you don't do that to him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you kept trying to run away. I kind of just sulked and sat there and watched it anyway. Yeah, I don't know. I think that in the moment, um, I didn't exactly want to watch this movie, and I didn't think I was going to like it. Uh, and I, boy, was I wrong. Uh, this movie was very impactful for me. So. Really enjoyed it. Changed uh-huh. your life. Yeah. I saw this before the original one, too, which, you know, might mean something, but we'll see. How about you, Irina? So I had seen it, let's see, a few times now before this. Uh, once was you showed it to me. Um, Gosh, I'm getting so tired of hearing me. myself showing people No, that movies. just means like, that you, you love like movies, movies yeah, and you want to share it. <laughs> So I watched it first with you. I didn't see it in theaters, but I had remembered you guys going to see it and talking about it afterwards saying, oh, it's so good. Yeah. And then I watched it again with David and then a third time. So I don't remember when, but um, all of those experiences definitely show that I liked the movie a lot. So. Awesome. Noah. I had my uh, my first time with David a couple days ago. <laughs> mm. It was grand. We're talking about it the was, movie. It was an experience. <laughs> oh, oh, really? Yes. <laughs> We're talking about Blade Runner. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, I saw that. Uh, same about time. A month ago. <laughs> <laughs> same time. <laughs> uh, so this movie was very special you for you. <laughs> <laughs> it was really <laughs> special. <laughs> um, all right. How about you, AJ? We kind of alluded to it last episode a little bit. I watched this uh, with Reese after it came out on Blu-ray. Uh, before I'd really Yeah, you kind can of say f- it. I made you, I made you watch it. No, you didn't. 
Uh, it was only like 3 a.m. in the morning, and I was trying to leave, and uh, you forced me. I locked the door. <laughs> no, yeah, those, AJ. The, that look in his eyes. <laughs> but um, Interlink. Yeah, so I hadn't really fully seen the first one yet, except for some a little bit of the uh, theatrical version. I kind of mentioned that last episode, I believe, too. But It's also kind of one of those movies that's so ingrained, the first one is so ingrained in pop culture that a lot of people that maybe haven't seen it think they have just because of a lot of the the imagery and the classic moments. Right. But, yeah. Cool. So first time for Noah, uh, second time for AJ, but first, if you consider it after watching the original. Mm-hmm. So in, first in order. <laughs> okay. Are you all ready to talk about the story? Break it down. It's gonna this strap in, guys. This could be a long one. We're gonna try to cut out a lot of the, I guess, unnecessary padding in the story. But it, this so is one David. of those movies that there, there's almost no unnecessary <laughs> padding because every moment there's something kind of important happening. Yeah. <laughs> or like some little. Podcast. Yeah. <laughs> totally. Uh, anyway, let's get into the story. In cool. twenty in twenty forty nine. Whoa, it was 2049. What a Whoa. surprise. Whoa. Uh, bioengineered humans known as replicants or slaves. Kay, a replicant, works for the Los Angeles Police Department as a Blade Runner, an officer who hunts and retires uh, rogue replicants. At a protein farm, he retires Sapper Morton and finds a box buried under a tree. The box contains the remains of a female replicant who died during a cesarean section. I'll cut out all the rest so I sound intelligent. Like uh, a cesarean right. section. Demonstrating that replicants can reproduce biologically, which was previously thought impossible. K's superior lieutenant Yoshi was jo- it Joshi? Joshi. Uh, fears that this could lead a war to uh, lead to a war between humans and replicants. She orders K to find and retire the replicant child to hide the truth. So glad I got through that without any issues. Wow, uh, that was the cleanest one you've done yet. Yeah. Ever. Um, okay. So this movie starts very similarly to the first Blade Runner with the opening of an eye, although that's not the first shot in Blade Runner. Uh, this, I felt like this movie was at least right off the bat tying itself to the first one in a at least a symbolic way. Uh, what did you think to the, of the opening to this movie? So I think that they showed him in the cruiser really with the music before anything, right? Or am I am I yeah. crazy? Yeah. No, the eye is first in this one. Yeah. Okay. Like yeah. the first. Yeah. Then it cuts right to him. I but- uh, I actually really liked the intro because it immediately immerses you in what kind of world it is at this point. It mm-hmm. almost seems even more downtrodden than uh, before, more yeah. hopeless. Mm-hmm. It is furthered it in. It's even more dystopian than it was yeah. Yeah. 30 years ago or so. Almost um, more like showing the wasteland of everything after the fact. So, Yeah, it's it's less bustling with life, I would mm-hmm. say, and it's more desolate. Yeah. Like, yeah. As he's going across L.A., which they make it seem like it's now just spread across the entire state pretty much. Because uh, <laughs> later on it references like them going to San Diego, which is now just the like municipal waste yeah uh, city so it's just kind of this sprawling desolate landscape with varying amounts of life in different areas it's, a lot so. can happen in 30 years <laughs> yeah the, yeah uh, visually the intro to this movie um is like reference level for like dolby vision and hdr um just mm-hmm. absolutely beautiful mm-hmm. oh this Definitely. this movie if if you have 4k the the means to play 4k I highly recommend this be in your collection. It is a must watch in that format. Definitely one of the best visual masterpieces, I think, of the 21st century so far. Yeah, and so the cinematography was done by the legendary Roger Deakins, who actually won his first Oscar for cinematography with this movie. He had been nominated previously 13 times, and he had collaborated with this director twice before this movie on Prisoners and uh, Sicario? No, Arrival. Yeah, it was Arrival and Prisoners. So yeah, this movie, it's, there's no question that this movie looks... Well, good for him, though. Visually stunning. It is a beautiful movie. Yeah, yeah. and I, since we're opening up on the... We're kind of just introduced to this world, we also get the score by Hans Zimmer. And I want to ask y'all, how do you think this compares to the Vangelis score uh, of the first Blade Runner? I think that uh, for me, it just has this more general sweeping sound, and I I love the almost simplicity of it. The 
each one, it's like you can connect them, but they have their own character to it. The first was more, a little more spacey, I think, outright 80s spacey. Mm -hmm. But uh, this one has that kind of larger than life sound to it. Again, very sweeping. And um, yes. I think I I could actually be lulled into kind of this peace and tranquility just listening to it alone. It's very beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's still Hypnotic in the same spirit. Word too. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I'd say it's uh, less of a less of a score and almost more of a mood creator. Or a, yeah, definitely. It sets a tone mm -hmm. in uh, some way. It's also another showcase for Hans Zimmer not being like just having one type of sound. Oh, I think yeah. he's very much he's a very versatile uh, composer. One of the one of the best. Uh, yeah. Got so many so many different varied scores that that you can s see little similarities between, mm -hmm. but he's able to do what he feels is best for the picture he's working on. Yeah. Uh, so I appreciate that about Hans Zimmer, and I think he's one of the greatest working composers today. But yeah, they did a really good job at it, you know capturing the same feel of it, and you know one of the reasons among others that Vangelis didn't return for this was because he himself was afraid that he couldn't capture the same greatness of the first. Mm. Right. So I might still, if, if, if I had a gun to my head, I might still pick the first one's yeah. music only, only ever so slightly just cause it, it kind of pioneered that whole, I don't know. It was just unconventional mm -hmm. using unconventional sounds and turning it into music and turning it into just an audible aesthetic that is just unique to Blade Runner. Mm -hmm. Auditory. Uh, yes. So we kind of zoom in on K, who is awoken after some travel to this grub farm or protein farm, where he meets Sapper, who Dave is a Batista. Yeah, who's a replicant who's been living on that farm for something like nine or twenty something years, twenty odd years. I forget how long it I was. Thought it was thirty. Well, he was, there was since supposed to 2019, he said, I believe, anyway. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he's been sent to retire him. So, what did y'all think of this whole sequence? Well, what first of all, I think <laughs> when I first saw this, I was thinking, whoa, Dave Batista. I just finished <laughs> seeing him as Drax. Whoa. I and know. so I, <laughs> I was impressed by his performance, his short performance, because he's. I don't know. I really admire him just as a person because he. he makes such a dedication to his roles now. He mm -hmm. wants to pursue his acting and perfect it. So I think he's more skilled than The Rock as ter mm -hmm. uh, in terms of wrestlers turned actors. Yeah, definitely. Or That's at least more statement. into... Well, the Rock is more his... of just like a, a showman with his acting. He's Batista like... Batista almost seems more thespian than The Rock does. Yeah, The Rock's funny and I like him. I like his performances, but they're all... you kind of know what you're getting with The Rock, whereas now I've, I've seen some diversity from Dave mm -hmm. Batista that I, I don't feel like I've seen as much from The Rock. Well, Scorpion but... King is a masterpiece. <laughs> Yeah, although The Rock did sing in Moana, so uh, yeah. that's true. Don't, don't he did sing. Some yeah, don't sleep on him. I think it's just because he's typecast. <laughs> I think maybe he's no. I don't. I don't want to make any assumptions about The Rock. I don't think he's scared of doing anything. I just think he's he's handed these big budget movie roles and he takes them. Yeah, and but yeah, it's and like Irina said, it's just it was really cool to see him in a you know completely. I don't want to say nonviolent because it did turn violent, but a little bit more gentle yeah. when he puts these tiny little like wire glasses on and right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was nice to see the subtle aging work that they did on him. Well, uh, too, he yeah. he looked like he was more kind of had the gray. He looked just more worn worn down by almost like a gentle giant kind mm -hmm. of. Oh yeah, yes, yeah. Instead uh, of growing it's... broccoli, he grows uh, grubs. Grubs, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I thought the scene was kind of. It was sad, but it's kind of a necessary scene to show that I don't know, just to kind of establish K and the position these that he is in. He's not he's slightly affected by what he's doing and it, it registers a little on an emotional level. Uh but this is like the first germ of what's going to grow into I don't know, what happens later on. Yeah. I have trouble when thinking about this scene on whether or not I should be talking more about the set and how much work they put into it, or if I should talk about the performances between the two of them. I mean, I feel like we could break down every single scene of this movie and split it apart and talk about it for hours, honestly. I know, which we won't do. Sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's tempting. It deserves it. I know. 
But yeah, the set pieces, they made everything practical. Like, it just, yeah. the whole thing, down to that whole room where he's doing all the grub farming, the water that they use for it, everything. Oh, the water. That's not what, that's not what shocks me about the practicality it's the water. of the movie. <laughs> it's the other, water. yeah, they put a, they put a hose in a, wild. in a little pool there. I was thinking, the water, well, I, was, guys. I was actually thinking of the bags they had hanging with the liquid in it that was for the grubs. I just think it's funny that that's what you would like describe as an impressive practical achievement. I was trying to think of something that was the first that came to mind. <laughs> the water, guys. Rewatchability. See that faucet? That's real water coming out of there. <laughs> <laughs> water. Well, how about, uh, did they actually tattoo a UV uh, serial number on his eye? They didn't ask him to, but Dave <laughs> Batista actually took it upon himself to do that because he wanted to be uh, 100%. As authentic as Dude, possible. Yeah. For, for two minutes in a movie, that's crazy. I know. And now it's there forever. I know. <laughs> it was cool but to, it's also to carry on cool. the motif of the eye, though, where, you know, and before the Nexus 6 units, the tail was the eye shine. And yeah. then here it's still the eye, but it's just, you know, it's reflecting, but it's hidden and it's actually their serial number, number stamped yeah. on them. Yeah. This fight was... Cool though. What oh, y'all say? Slams him through a wall. Yeah. And, uh, uh, yeah. And then, uh, of course, he incapacitates him. Which I was like, man, Dave Bautista is a big guy. I don't know if Ryan Gosling would be able to handle that, but he he does. That, well, that, but also, that, you have to think the replicants are actually stronger uh, in nature than uh, regular humans are. Yeah. Well, then they or, were both replicants. No, they were both replicants. Oh, they, they were oh both. that's right. Well, yeah, but, right, he, right. but he's a newer model, yeah. so obviously he would be stronger. Yeah. yeah. That throat but, punch, though, that was yeah. like... Oh, that was... <laughs> I can only imagine Dave Batista is going through this fight just thinking, he said, I could beat the living crap out of but, this guy. Yeah. An, a, but, but another cool thing yeah. about this movie is you get a sense of how it actually does action. I don't consider this an action movie at all. It's like far, far from it. But the action scenes are in quick, realistic bursts. Like, they're not these protracted sequences that take forever, except towards the end when I feel like it was kind of necessary and cool. But yeah, not a lot of, like, there's not a huge action set piece in this movie that everyone just pauses the story to be like, all right, look at all this choreography and explosions and everything like that. It's, I feel like the action is just another ornament on the tree. Yeah. Uh, and this interaction really does a great job of immediately setting up Kay's character as, you know, measured and collected. And he's still, um, you know, when he's trying to apprehend uh, Morton, he's, mm -hmm. you know, fighting him. And there's a point where he has him knocked down. He tells him, don't get up, because he still hasn't technically verified that he's a, a replicant until he does the scan. Yeah. But then he fights back. And then so, he, you know, he wastes him. But Yeah. So he finds a flower, does a scan, and then finds a crate with bones in it. Bones. Bones. But that, so that'll be more important. Um, I guess we can talk about that right now. Mm -hmm. That is kind of the next thing. I mean, they bring it back to headquarters. Yeah, it brings it back and they examine it and uh, discover that it had given birth. And also, it's got a serial number. Whoa. This is where they kind of set up where they show how, you know, skinners or skin, skin, skin jobs, jobs. Uh, all those lovely terms are not... Very well liked. Yeah. That's the fir another indicator that I don't think this movie is trying to do that same message that the original Blade Runner did, mm -hmm. which is, what does it mean to be human? I mean, it kind of is. Yeah. Not the but same But it's way, also, though. it's taking it to a different space. And well, it's, it's like more about, okay, so what if it's not human? How about AIs? Can, do, does it have a soul or... I, it's yeah. that, and I also think it's trying to say that humans are no longer human, and uh, yeah. replicants are more yeah. human it than really, human. Yeah, the they movie, literally yeah. say that. Puts the first on its head and inverts it. Like, even when he returns to the station, he goes through basically the baseline test, but it's almost like the reverse of the Voight-Kampf, you know, establishing that he doesn't yeah. have emotional yeah. response. Um, yeah. And, yeah. you know, it's basically the other side of the coin from the first, you know, ask the question, is Deckard a replicant and then here we're asking is k human um yeah not to get too far ahead but the whole you know kind of motif of this is inverted from the first yes so we have a pregnant replicant which apparently means war so uh, lieutenant joshi basically gives the spiel of this uh the existence of a naturally born um offspring from a replicant implies that mm -hmm. there is no hard wall or separation between human and replicant and if people learn that, then there's going to be some kind of actual yeah, combat uprising. or fight, uprising, that kind of thing. Yeah. 
And it's funny because she literally says that her job is to basically keep peace, keep the status quo. And her name, Joshi, um, is Indian, and it refers to Vishnu, uh, who is the preserver god who protects things from being destroyed and keeps the peace. So it's kind of keeping the status quo. She is supposed to act as any other law enforcement should act even today, is that they are meant to keep a balance, make sure everyone abides by the law and keep things in harmony because once someone does or there is an imbalance, you have chaos. Mm -hmm. And so she's supposed to help control that chaos where technically there is an invisible wall between things, like she says, but you, they are set in place to make sure people keep in mind that there is this invisible wall. I'll say if she was, if there was no Wallace in this movie, she would be the villain. Mm -hmm. I think she is a villain. She's just like, it's just her role in this is irrelevant compared to the bigger picture. I don't, I don't agree because I never got that really because I I think she's, if you had to make her any kind of type of character, she'd have to be, I guess, something of a, uh, anti-hero where she doesn't hesitate to have Kay go out and kill the baby replicant. Exactly. But she's doing it for the motivation that's going to save the world because she I thinks think the world is going to be it's destroyed. The, she's working from the greater good mentality. Yeah. And the greater good. She's, you, <laughs> you can imagine that from the human perspective, they're told replicants are replicants, essentially robots. They don't have feeling. They don't have emotions. They don't have rights. They are servants. They are put in place to serve us. So she doesn't think of this baby as like really human either. Mm-hmm. Well, because it's from a replicant. Yeah, and I I see where Reese you're coming from because she is the figurehead of the status quo from the human side, and if she's yeah. basically you know lost that morality of the you know the the value of life. Um, mm-hmm. Whereas you know we see the more empathic side in the replicants now than than the humanic side. Right, yeah, and she has she she vocalizes this at one point, but she justifies her killing of replicants as they yep. don't have souls. She's she even though I think she feels otherwise, judging by a scene later on in Kay's apartment where mm-hmm. she tries to come on to him, she I think she sees more than just a soulless husk. Um, but I think that's just what she tells herself at night to make her feel okay about her reactions. Yeah, yeah. she literally tells but, Kay, "You got on fine without one," meaning a soul so far. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Which, it, but that's kind of what I've uh, been saying. She's not exactly a bad guy, even though her decisions make you think that she would be because it's a morally unsound decision to make to kill Mm -hmm. a child. But it is for the sake of the greater good, which she believes to be uh, the right thing to do. So it's kind of just this uh, cool complexity to her character. It also begs the question of what it is to be good or bad in this because, I mean, you have the obviously set up to be bad characters later, which we'll talk about, Mm -hmm. comes into contact with her. But she's obviously fighting for the replicant side. So should we be on her side? I don't really support her side. I don't know what she's fighting for. Well, it's really complicated because you watch it at first and you're thinking, oh, is she okay? At in the beginning and then towards the end you're like hmm maybe no not really i think she's she's her <laughs> goal that. is to preserve status quo right yeah yeah all right and before we move on to the next section of the story this will be our longest probably until towards the end <laughs> so don't don't worry like i don't think the next paragraphs will be as long right uh, but no promises uh, but we should talk about ryan gosling in this role um, um how do you do you think he compares favorably to harrison ford in the first film I think so, if not yes. more in Agreed. some ways. Um, yeah. He, whereas I, I know I mentioned this in the previous podcast, but Harrison Ford's character was more like a vehicle to make a point. His He wasn't himself fleshed out that much. Mm-hmm. Whereas in this film, it feels that Kay is a little more developed. The story is more about him versus the entire world. That That is a theme, is to represent this world and their morality and the way they view replicants but he's kind of the center focus in Mm -hmm. a sense yeah didn't you say the villains in the last movie like roy he was really the main character you were focusing on in the the last movie his was almost the story that you're supposed to know he's the emotional um, story the emotional relatability 
Right. And yes. in this one, K, the central character is more of the story, the arc that you're supposed to be following. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely think Harrison Ford had more of a one-note performance in that one. I know there were some nuance, but I think that Ryan Gosling added way more nuance. And yes. maybe it was because we got more screen time with him and less of others, but I I really liked Ryan Gosling's performance in this. Mm-hmm. He, he's like the... He's the crowd's seat, sort of, and uh, Roy is the point of the story, kind of. He's, mm-hmm. he's You're watching it pretty much from Harrison Ford's perspective, and yeah. Roy is the main attraction. Yeah, also, kinda. Harrison Ford, uh, this is not, I'm not trying to disrespect him, but he's always seemed like the actor who just kind of like, the person who wasn't an actor who just kind of tumbled into acting, <laughs> yeah. you know? Because yeah. I, I feel like that was the story, was that the story around Indiana Jones where he's kind of on the set? And I, I think don't it was recall. something like this. I don't know the details, but it was kind of like he stumbled into acting. He's, he's like the only- that guy that says, I could do acting. He starts doing it, and you're like, wow, uh, okay. He, he, oh, he never seems like he wants to be there. I don't. I don't know that he, he, he didn't go for acting, but I think he probably some of it came as a natural byproduct of his charisma and his yes. charm. So he kind of yeah. you know it's social lubricant. So he gets those positions without maybe scrambling as hard. And I'm not saying he didn't work hard, but maybe you right. know yeah. compared to some other people, who really clawed their way in. Yeah. yeah. He he just strikes me as the actor who anytime a director tells him to do something, he's like, Ugh, "Do I have to do that? All right." <laughs> like at least in, at this this age, Harrison Ford, maybe especially at this age. <laughs> he he much like uh, Robert Downey Jr. in Iron Man, just seems like he's acting out himself. Yeah, you know? I, can, I can see that. Too. In a and lot of himself his is roles. A, a curmudgeon. Now, yeah, exactly. <laughs> before we leave this paragraph, I think it skips over uh, the apartment scene with Joy, and I think yeah, we we're talking Joy. about well, yeah. Um, Kay's emotionality, and I think this scene really highlights that with the introduction oh, yeah. of Joy um, and him yeah. basically, you know, kicking uh, his, his shoes off and putting his feet up. Literally, yeah. you know, he said, I need a drink, and he lights up a cigarette. It's, those are things that are associated with, you know, human frailty that, you know, it's kind of a yes. a tool, but why would a, a kind replicant of a coping need that thing? Yes. Yeah. Mechanism. Also, he as a replicant, he a lot of the, he's very cultured in mm. old time human, you know, interests i guess like his Frank music Sinatra. choices his book choices oh, yeah. is he, he's, he does his whole after work decompress routine yeah you know well, that's a long day at work i want to relax have yeah. my whiskey cigarette say hi to my lady <laughs> lady joy I, I do think uh anna de armas does a really good job she does role yeah. as well. I, actually, I really like her character too i don't know if you guys felt this way but i thought it was interesting whether there was a point to this or not but uh, when he does come home, it is like the housewife greeting him, preparing dinner, things like that, having sharing a drink. Mm-hmm. But uh, the fact that she changes her appearance so many times within a short period of time, yeah, almost makes me feel since she was her, she is designed specifically to accommodate the user's needs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He almost doesn't know what he wants it like is how, and, how do you accommodate to someone like that who is a replicant yes right yeah and actually joy i feel like is you know for not being a real figure is actually has some subtle complexity to her in representing right. yes. some of those themes like her little like notifi- notification sound the jingle for the yeah. wallace corporation is an excerpt from the peter and the wolf the strings section right. representing peter the, wall- the wallace jingle oh yeah, yeah yeah and so that kind of like it's a fantasy for children in orchestra form that jingle, the theme of Peter and the Wolf has kind of been stated over man versus, you know, dominating nature. Peter con- conquers the wolf. And so I think right. Wallace yeah. kind of embodies that. We haven't really met Wallace yet, but um, him basically creating his own life forms to dominate nature. Right. And so there's a lot right. of sinister undertones to Joy, even though she is designed to uh, basically yeah. appease you, make you happy. And it's almost like there's a l- element of like Facebook where it's like super stalker, all the metadata gathered right. on you. And um, yeah. we at first see, oh, this is, you know, a really true companion, almost, you know, a soulmate for him. And right. then we kind of learn later on down the line. And it's like, is that really the case? Is this just kind of a yeah. a, a fantasy? Well, it's, it's kind of reminding me of the way we see ads today, where every ad is focused on, the personal experience like this is about you specifically for you but when you mm-hmm. think about that that's in mass so yeah. they're essentially talking to everyone 
So while you're feeling like you're getting the manicured tailored experience, in fact, everyone is getting the same treatment. So it's not as personal. Yeah, as yeah. It she's comes a physical across. like manifestation or mouthpiece for his subconscious. Right. Um, like she even says, you know, there's that Nabokov book on the pale fire on the counter, and she's like, I hate this book. Um, and the we made the spoof of the interconnect thing, his baseline test. Those lines come from mm. that book. And the book actually shows up a couple of times. It's a kind of interesting book. Uh, The main part of the book is a 999-line poem uh, that goes into a lot of stuff. But um, Mm -hmm. they Uh, obviously do have... Go ahead. I had a thought on Joy. I mean, y'all are kind of convincing me otherwise. But I took her as kind of the stand-in for the questions that the first Blade Runner wanted you to think about, which is Mm -hmm. like, what is it? The what does it mean to be human? I thought she was like the stand-in for that in this movie, only not, on a micro on a micro level. Yeah, where it's like, I think we've proven that replicants have human souls. So she's almost like the Rachel of this movie. Yeah, but well, I, I, no, I, was, I no, she's the hair, let, she's let, the let, she's let the she's the Deckard in a way where you don't you don't know if all of this is just what has been programmed into her to yeah. be just to like try to respond to anything that the user likes in a right. way that's favorable or if she actually is becoming somewhat sentient towards the yeah. end yeah like that's that that's what i got from her and you character. never I think feel like right. you can have proof one yeah. way or the other i think she's an yeah. amalgam of both so you're not necessarily wrong and they're not necessarily mutually exclusive like it can be that right. part in addition to yeah. that which is why i think personally that she is one of the most important characters in the movie despite her kind of yeah. superficial Exp- yeah. uh, appearance but uh in addition to that uh she's kind of a uh, tragic character uh you just imagine her life as an ai and she's pretty much confined to that is if non-reality she, that is if she even oh, is aware of her own existence yeah mm-hmm. the thing is like well yeah i mean if it, uh supposing she is an actual ai she would be but yeah. uh if not then She's not an actual AI and she's just a program. Yeah. So it depends on what their view of that is. But it's yeah. just really sad that, you know, you think about that character and what kind of existence that is. And Yeah, that's <laughs> what this Blade Runner, these Blade Runner movies are all about, is just making you think about stuff. Uh, let's move on. Kay visits the headquarters of the Wallace Corporation, the successor to the defunct Tyrell Corporation in the manufacture of replicants. Wallace staff members identify the deceased female from DNA archives as Rachel, an experimental replicant designed by Dr. Eldon Tyrell. Kay learns of Rachel's romantic ties with former Blade Runner Rick Deckard. Wallace Corporation CEO Neander Wallace wants to discover the secret to replicant reproduction to expand interstellar colonization. He sends his replicant enforcer Love to steal Rachel's remains and follow Kay to Rachel's child. I think this Ooh. is where it comes to one of my maybe my only flaw with this film Wallace I don't like him I, I don't like him either but I I could also see I, this guy Yeah it's Go ahead No go I'll let Irina finish It's it's just that I think this is the least convincing character of the group and um I like his character concept I just think that the actor doesn't come across to me as actually that deep it's, I I don't. I, I don't yeah. think it's. I don't think it's the performance. I think it's what he's saying. Yeah. I, well, I don't know. I. I think mm. if you had the right actor, it could make sense. So but I can't I believe just, I'm yeah. defending Jared Leto, but oh, I really? disagree with you. Oh, really? Interesting. Interesting. Right. Okay. Um, I. I do think his performance was good, and the. I. The first watch here, I did agree with you, but upon a couple more wa- watches, and I actually found Wallace's character pretty fascinating, despite his mm-hmm. on the nose nose god complex. Um, yeah, and it, it's kind of interesting because he's literally in an echo chamber. The, every room, every speech he makes, there's echoes of his own voice. Um, but he mm-hmm. he truly has like a, a messiah complex. Um, he mm-hmm. speaks in terms of the kingdom of heaven, his workers as angels. Um, literally calls the the replicants that he's created clay, and then talks about storming Eden, retaking it. They're like his children. He yeah. says I think multiple times. Yeah, they're his yep. children, and it, it's just. Um, and he even almost pulls hair later on. He's like, there's a child, bring it to me. Um, mm-hmm. I read a little bit of, about Leto's appearance, and he's a method actor, and um, as you may or may not know. Uh, and yeah. those contacts he had, those were actually occluded, or you know, basically he couldn't see. So he was wearing these things to make himself blind. 
And mm-hmm. here again is the, cool. the motif of the eyes where he has those artificial floating eyes. Those are his, you know, little drones that are his, his uh, cybernetic eyes. Um, yeah. And okay. even I think Ryan Gosling said on set that he would come in and walk in on set and someone would basically be leading him because he would already have the contacts and wouldn't know where he's going. But there was just kind of like a awe that fell over the cast and a lot of these uh, behind the scenes recounts, I think, are sometimes embellished, but people even he said they felt like he was like jesus walking to the temple kind of thing and yeah Mm -hmm. like jared leto as much as you know flack as he gets i think that lends a little bit of substance to this character even though it is kind of obvious and on the nose about him just being this diabolical uh Mm -hmm. villain here and you know just how over the top he goes i think just kind of furthers the symbolism that this movie does really well and some of it is nuanced, some of it is very subtle, and I think it needs some of that in your face a little bit to kind of be the glue yeah. to stick it all together. Because yeah. um, he even says he, he took us to nine new worlds, and nine is actually a really reoccurring number in this. And I'll go over into more symbols later, but um, I, I thought he was a good balance to kind of bring maybe a little bit of the less seriousness of this side of the movie just to kind of keep things moving forward. Yeah. Mm. I also think that you 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 must know that uh, Wallace. It must drive him mad that his predecessor Tyrell figured out how to make a replicant that could give birth, and he's been trying so hard mm-hmm. and just hasn't been able to crack the code. And I, I think Ty, uh, Tyrell probably did it unknowingly, right? But still, he's probably just like, "There's got to be some." I don't know. It's just it's something I thought about. Yeah. I, yeah. He's driven to madness yeah. in kind of a different way, but I was thinking that as far as um, he Wallace goes, I have to I have to blend my answer. I really like the concept of his character, and uh, I do think that he does a good job acting out the part. But there's this aspect of it that is a little too spacey, mm-hmm. uh, and his his mind is a little too out Close there. To I would have, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I would have preferred him to be almost a little more down to earth and a little more charismatic because people that are in that role are usually sociopaths or psychopaths that are able to manipulate many people just because they're so charismatic. And uh, Mm. he He doesn't seem like a world leader, though, with it because you need the charisma to lead people, but he has power through creation. And I think that he doesn't even care about having charisma. I mean, I don't think he needs it. You make a point, but the fact it. It, the the thing about those kinds of god complex characters is that they do usually have a level of charisma to them. I'd say he has a certain degree of charisma in a weird way. Uh, I think it wasn't, it's not so much that it, the writing or the character, I love the concept and I like everything he has to say. I just, I, I can't deny that once I got to this part and his character was introduced, I just lost some of the magic of the film. Like I'll, I I don't I can't explain why. I'll level no, I'll level with you in one way. I think the only thing I thought is like, does he give this deranged sermon to love like every time she comes downstairs? He's I think just like, that's it. I'm going to talk about like, creation maybe, again. Who knows? Maybe he does. <laughs> yeah. Like he's it just all alone like, down there. I think I mean, the problem is it just seemed like week. exposition in yeah, a movie that is so I think that might be why and it was just a uh, too much on it, on my part, other than that, like I was actually more interested in love as a character because she's yes. you. You have this really this huge sense of unhinged, mm-hmm. but very controlled. At but the same also, time. Y- you also think that is a she is more human yeah. than Wallace is. Yeah, and she is showing anger. She she like fear even cries fear at even, times. Yes. Like when his eyes come in, you can see her tense up. And yeah. I I have to commend this actress for her acting because she. She has this way of, in very small ways, conveying a mood or an emotion mm-hmm. and kind of a slew of them all at once. Yeah. That And she doesn't even have to say anything. She even even shows a bit of attraction to Kay at one yeah. little very subtle scene mm-hmm. when well, she's like pulling the file on uh, Rachel. This is well, Sylvia and Hux. And a future scene a little bit. Yes, yeah, mm-hmm. Sylvia Hux. Yeah, so but I, we won't I, get into I that really yet. like this actress for sure. Yeah. So she does a on great top job. Of, of her performance and Jared Leto's performance, what really kind of got me was the atmosphere of the set pieces. Like the, the Wallace Corporation, mm-hmm. the way they built out the sets, how grandeur 
everything is. <laughs> grandiose. <laughs> that's how the word. It is. <laughs> I was going to go with grandiose. <laughs> Interlinked. Interlinked. And so the rooms themselves were actually built out and they had water everywhere. Yeah. Oh, water. water? <laughs> the reflections, everything about it. I heard that when you're actually in those rooms, it felt incredibly real. Mm-hmm. Like what you see is what was actually there. It That's wasn't really like a small cool. room with green screen. Yeah. It so was like a the, lot of a lot so, of light and reflection play, which was a big thing in the original Blade Runner as yeah. well. So those scenes where uh, Ryan Gosling is um, outside and it's raining, is that real water? That was water interlinked. Yes. Water. <laughs> wow. Uh, I do uh, another interesting note to convey how rich um, Tyrell. I keep wanting to say Tyrell, but con- to convey Wallace, how rich Wallace. Wallace's place is, everything mm-hmm. is wood. Which, yeah. If you, oh yeah, I, I, I read this, but wood and trees are a very rare resource Mm -hmm. or not even a resource it's just you can't find wood anywhere but they're also synonymous with life and uh yeah because uh you know you have the whole tree of life and Mm -hmm. uh you see wood as kind of a living object in a world that's you know everything is futuristic if it's if it's not dead it's a it's a metal or synthetic building Mm -hmm. or some form of hologram Mm -hmm. yeah but as i was saying his whole his whole place is made of wood Mm-hmm. Just to kind of convey how so he has the money to burn is. to keep yeah. wood I just thought that was and create interesting. a whole domicile with it, like a modern a yeah, future right. day pope. There, there's multiple things that yeah, that yeah, and him being the creator of life and viewing himself as a god, it shows that you know he yeah. want that living aspect in his own home. Uh, we also get Mackenzie. Before we move on, I guess I don't want to talk about her very much, but Mackenzie Davis who plays Mariette. She's kind of been following um, Kay. Mm-hmm. Well, we're first introduced that. with, I mean, they're obviously prostitutes, but they're kind of instructed by Love to go, hey, interrogate him, see what he's about, kind of just um, see what's going on. And then the other two recognize that he's a Blade Runner immediately. And then being replicants are like, oh, I'm out of here. But then yeah. Mariette stays, sticks around and she's like, you know, a little bit more, I guess, experienced with, you know, kind of dealing with threats and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. At Morton's farm, Kay sees the date 6 10, 21, carved into the tree trunk and recognizes it from a childhood memory of a wooden toy horse. Because Replicant's memories are artificial, Kay's holographic AI girlfriend, Joy, believes this is evidence that Kay was born, not created. He searches LAPD records and discovers twins born on that date with identical DNA aside from the sex chromosome. But only the boy is listed as alive. Kay tracks the child to an orphanage in ruined San Diego, but discovers the records from that year to be missing. Kay recognizes the orphanage from his memories and finds the toy horse where he remembers hiding it. So I think that this shows that Joy has a little bit more going on than just a program, in my opinion. Or is it his subconscious with the hope that he might be actually real? It can't just be her... (laughs) being his subconscious the whole time. I don't think anyway. I think it's regardless. Both. Yeah. I think it's uh really um uh, well done the way they just crafted the story from the beginning and added in a new kind of plot device uh to add emotional depth to uh K. K. Yeah. Yeah, so now you you and the question you're meant to wonder is whether k is a born replicant or a just a standard a created replicant i guess i mean they're both created but oh, yeah. you know what i mean mm-hmm. manufactured <laughs> well then that also leads to the question you know if you're born are you a replicant or are you human and then does it matter do you have a soul can replicants have souls you know it kind of leads to the whole deck of cards yep. oh yeah ties all back into cards. That. Uh, those are <laughs> It all goes back to you what is human. Uh, so this part of the movie, I get its significance, but it, I thought this was kind of a lull mm-hmm. for me. Where when he um, goes to the to visit all the orphans and he has the memories. Of oh, the that. flashback. I I actually really like the you want to go for a ride line, and then it just cuts, and you hear the original Blade Runner theme play. <laughs> just the the journey out to that location is really mm. cool. And that brief little action sequence, another like quick burst action sequence. Yeah. I thought that was neat, but the actual, once he gets there and he's investigating, I was, this is... that is so opposite for me. Okay. Honestly, when they got to that scene, I was more intrigued on what was happening in the story. When they did the actual memory where mm-hmm. he's kind of walking through where he was 
or wasn't a place when he was a kid. Um, it was very, I don't know. I was more engaged because it, it poked the question even more in my brain. Yeah, this is the moment where he first acts on something that's purely his own interest. Yeah. Because it is, you can argue in some way, related to his mission or operative. Yeah, but he has an it, ulterior this is the motive. first time where he's <laughs> considering checking something out because he personally is invested in it. Mm. Yeah, uh, viewing it from that perspective, it's uh, pretty interesting. I hadn't really thought about it mm. uh, in that way. I was uh, beforehand, I was thinking of it a little bit more on uh, Reese's side here and thinking not necessarily that it's a, a negative aspect of it. I didn't but think more, it was bad. I yeah, did not yeah, think it was just bad. Just kind of a lull. Yeah. But uh, but I I, w- I will agree that to some extent it it is a it is a lull. It's kind of a slowdown of the development. It's not a quick paced movie. Well, mm-hmm. nothing at this point. in nothing in the movie yeah. is very quick paced. This falls in line with everything else. I feel like it just has a little bit more in depth than the plot. Mm. Yeah, yeah, and I actually really appreciate uh, that <laughs> aspect of it. I really like the slow burn of the story. colors to look at. <laughs> it's just one of those points of a movie that really depends on the mood you're in. Because upon yeah. first yeah, viewing, yeah. this does drag on. And I'm like, okay, let's get, get to some action. What's going on? And you're eager to find out the story. And then, you know, upon critical rewatching, you're like, oh, there is, this is just laden with symbolism, which mm. I can't just take you down like a whole trip down false memory lane right here if you're ready. Take us down. Take, Lay it down. Take us, take us down a quick trip. All right. I'll try to be quick. So, um, <laughs> you don't have to. Dude, don't try to be quick. I like, I like your, um, deep dive professorial, uh, <laughs> teachings. <laughs> All right, so we briefly talked about the number nine, which kind of pops up quite a bit in the symbols of this movie. Uh, we said Joshi was kind of, you know, representative of Vishnu, which has, he has uh, nine um, avatars or personas. And then we had the book uh, Pale Fire, which has a poem that is 999 lines long. Uh, K is a Nexus 9 model replicant. And Wallace talked about taking society to nine new worlds, and then children can count on nine fingers and it's not enough. Um, and then when Kay is investigating the DNA nucleotides for the, the twins and kind of find who the orphanage and all that stuff, he says the girl died of Galatian syndrome. Um, mm-hmm. And there's actually a lot of biblical Galatians. imagery in this movie as well. And Galatians is the ninth book of the New Testament. Dang. Uh, we have the characters love and joy, which Galatians is famous for introducing the fruits of the spirit, which there are nine love and joy being the first two. And let's see what else. Uh, One of the most remembered lines of (laughs) Galatians is there's neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female for all you are one in Christ Jesus. So we have basically a presentation of a false dichotomy. You are not Jew or Gentile slave or free. And here we're saying, you know, you're not man or replicant. Um, it's breaking down those walls between because, you know, we're looking for a soul here. Mind blown. Dude, <laughs> so you're saying that uh, the number nine boils down when you go to the brass tacks to exactly, uh, what is it, a parable? It could be. I mean, I don't know that it's a parable, but it's just, or just kind a- of, um, I would say, intentional symbolism that's kind of beneath the surface. So that's so that is the significance of the nine, though. Kind of just, uh, I mean, their you, whole. You existence. can go into numerology. Anyone can interpret numbers however they want, but this is mm-hmm. what I found related to it. It seems and, like a lot of connecting dots that couldn't just be coincidental. Well, I mean, yeah. he specifically mentioned Galatian syndrome. It, they're on Nexus Nine. I feel like this is an intentional. Hey, you know, let's let's put a little bit of um, interconnected tissue behind all this to flesh it out. Oh, yeah. 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 How follow up though? What. Uh, what do you think Galatian syndrome actually is in the movie, though? Like, what kind well, of it disease? Was, or... it, they they had no immune system. Is that what that was? Yeah, like they had no immune system. Okay. Just, so they just died of illness. Yeah, pretty much and it's right also away. kind of an allusion to the, the first movie where they said someone had um, Methuselah syndrome. I think it was, mm-hmm. what's his name, the guy that oh. made all the toys, yeah. uh, which is another biblical reference here. So it's yeah. just kind of a, also a callback to the original. One thing I love about uh, Blade Runner, it is rife with symbolism, mm-hmm. and uh, and it's not just a you know there are a lot of movies that have symbolism, but the symbolism is 
you know, it's not very deep. It's kind of a superficial thing they just to say that it's it got it. Your face like this yeah. is symbolism. But, but this Look one you have to actually dig deep into, and uh, it's a lot more subtle, but at the same time, just as poignant. Yeah, it's, it's there, really interesting. Sure. But I think that's where kind of um, it unfortunately is a symptom of you know putting this kind of thing in a movie. There's they do it really organically, but sometimes it does cause that little bit of lag or lull. Uh, in the mm-hmm. middle here that, you know, if you're just trying to get through a movie and want to watch all the action, then you're going to be like, okay, come on, get on with it. Well, the thing is, I, I definitely see the importance of this. I'm I'm just saying the pacing, it, yeah. it does. Oh, slow. I, I agree like with I, you. I do. Yeah, I, would, you. I would not cut this out of the movie. For I the agree as well, but I actually deeply respect a movie that um, has the, you know, the cojones to slow, slow it down, down even yeah. though that's not what the audience is like in a movie. Yeah. Uh, well, ju- th- that shows that it, they're they they care more about the pride project than they do the dollar signs. Something that they do in this movie, and I, I guess I should say they also do it in the other Blade Runner. They also did it in Ghost in the Shell. They all were not afraid to slow it down. It was a very it's a it's a slow moving, dramatic movie. Yeah. But this one, they there's something about the way they take pauses when somebody does something that's impactful. They they will hold the camera and run it for 10, 15 seconds, I feel like, at, at times when something impactful happens. Yeah. If he slices someone's throat, you yeah. stand there and you watch that happen for 10 seconds and watch it. Yeah, but yeah. not a moment of it is superfluous. I would exactly. argue personally that, you know, comparing uh, Blade Runner, the first one, and this one, with that pacing issue, this one, in my opinion, hooks you a little bit more emotionally, so it carries you along, whereas in the first, if you get that lag, you're like, okay, you know, it's kind of vague. Let's go. Oh, I agree completely. But I say they both they both have that emotional effect on me. That and I think they're this is these two movies are just si- equal siblings. I think they're like twins, but just not identical twins. Maybe one's a replicant, Reese. <laughs> uh, Maybe one's real well, and one's a replicant. Case in point, yeah. the um, whole you know going down the path to the furnaces uh, or the blue room, whatever was in the orphanage. There is you're like you're on the edge of your seat. Is that horse in there? At least I oh, was. Yeah. I, oh, I remember the first time I saw that scene. I was I was on the edge of my seat too. I was super excited to see what, if it was there. Well, yeah. the uh, the that emotional capacity in uh, both movies I think is prevalent. The first one, actually, far as I've uh, seen, comes forth from uh, Roy more so than it does Deckard, and in this one it is more through K or yeah Joe. And both both of which are replicants, for yeah, sure. Exactly, which is uh, <laughs> that's funny. Well, I just love the way that they uh, crafted both of those characters. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we should also before we move on. This is also when we learn that Love is tracking uh, K, just because she knows that he's got coordinates and access and more knowledge into where this child might be. So she's kind of watching his back. Yeah, but only to you know capture him later on yeah and she's sitting back letting him do the the hard footwork and i thought that was cool she's just sitting literally reclining in a chair getting her nails done while she's calling an ordinance strikes um yeah, fire, as he lands and again. it was funny because <laughs> i thought it was a cool call back to the original too here she's literally imitating deckard's tone of voice where he's like pan left 30 degrees east fire when he was you know doing the whole enhanced thing on the yeah. uh, photograph mm-hmm. um so that kind of same voice command technology carried over and i just yeah. really loved it uh, Vina Nueva, like he really captures the spirit of the original while also kind of doing something standalone here um, oh, that's yeah. good in its own right. And um, just kind of the presence of an orphanage in the middle of a gigantic, you know, landfill is just, it's it really kind of shows you how desperate humanity's become. And it does mm-hmm. flip that totem pole of humanity kind of on the bottom at the dregs of society. I, I also a visu- cool visual touch, and I don't know if it was intentional. It had to be. But it does zoom in on her eye, and mm-hmm. there's explosions and fire kind of going up around the mm-hmm. her cornea and through mm-hmm. the lens, kind of like that or the second shot in the original Blade Runner, which oh. shows the eye and the flame going oh. up the up the mm-hmm. side of the cornea. Yeah. From the, yeah, yeah. So I don't know if that oh, was. I thought I'm, you were sure going along. The uh, <laughs> Wikipedia article here skipped over a little uh, mini scene uh, where Kay goes to visit Gaff in his re- you know uh, retirement home. Oh yeah, uh, Gap being, same same guy, Edward James almost. Yep, um, and makes another origami thing. Yep, sheep kind of calling back to the do androids dream of electric sheep to the title of the original book, but 
uh, Gaff really dropped some callbacks to the original, kind of throwing a wrench in the whole chain of the discussion, replicant versus human of Deckard. Um, yeah, so. He says Deckard wasn't long for this world, something in his eyes, uh, kind of alluding mm-hmm. to the eye shine that we saw in uh, yeah. Deckard's eyes. And then he also this says, does it, yeah, he also it says that same line where it's like, it pulls it back. It gives you something, but yep. then it pulls it back again. Yeah. Deckard, so was that a, he also says Deckard is new Jas, which is uh, like the city speak, but it's pulled from Hungarian meaning retired, uh, which is, can be taken literally Deckard retired and just kind of went off to live his life and also mm-hmm. mean retired as in what they say when they retire the replicants or kill them. Yeah. yeah. The uh, origami in this movie is that the same guy? Yes. Yep. So that that was just to convey that it was the same guy. Okay. Yeah. Good. Because throughout actor, the movie, too. I was like, "Oh, he's back! Yay! I like that guy." But then they didn't show him anymore. I was like, kind of sad. Yeah, it was mm-hmm. nice to have him. Nice to see him. Yeah. But it's good to know that he's still in the world. And, alive we, bri- and kicking. we we briefly touched on how you you were anticipating this moment, but let's actually talk about it real quick before sure. we move on. But the moment where he does find the horse statuette in his from his dreams. Uh, what's going through y'all's heads when this happens? I was like, oh. Yeah. I think the first time I saw this film, I was thinking, oh, is he actually a human, but he's been brainwashed into thinking he's a replicant and acting yeah. like maybe he's just special mm. in that way and that helps with his uh, investigations. I don't know. But yeah. um, at that point, I remember thinking, this is interesting. I mm-hmm. kind of want to know now if he's actually human because you're not you're not guaranteed that still because it could just be a memory that happened to be true mm. and but not his. Yeah, I love that intrigue mm-hmm. in that moment there too. Yeah. But what I liked was when I was watching this with Noah, I think when when this question was posed and when they find the the horse, I think he said something along the lines of, well, I mean, it could still just be a real memory implanted, right? Mm. But then later, not too much far later into the movie, they bring that up and they're like, actually, it's illegal to do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you next can't paragraph. use real memories, right? So yeah. it's it's being tricky to me. Yeah. Well, it allows it because I can see how that would be the next jump, especially after the first movie. But then they yeah. they they find a way to make it more believable. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, let's uh, push on. Uh, Doctor Anna Stellin, Stellin, I don't ever know. <laughs> a replicant memory designer confirms that the memory of the orphanage is real, leading Kay to conclude that he is Rachel's son. At LAPD headquarters, K fails a post-traumatic baseline test, mark- marking him as a rogue replicant. He lies to Joshi by implying he killed the, the replicant child. Joshi gives K 48 hours to disappear. At Joy's request, K reluctantly transfers her to an emanator so he cannot be tracked through her console memory files. He has the toy horse analyzed, revealing traces of radiation that, led, uh, that lead him to the ruins of Las Vegas. He finds Deckard, who reveals that he is the father of Rachel's child and that he scrambled the birth records to protect the child's identity. Deckard left the child in the custody of the replicant freedom movement. So this is uh, really the turning point of the movie, uh, emotional lies. Yes. Oh, so, yeah. And that happens with the uh, Dr. Anna Staline, who's a very crucial character who gets very little screen time, but makes packs a wallop in that yeah. moment that she has. And, what, yeah. It makes uh, uh, his breakdown even more impactful because this whole ha- half of the movie before he's just even killed, methodical, you know, calm, and then all of a sudden mm-hmm. when she tells him that it's a real memory, he just snaps. Yeah, mm-hmm. I was yeah. just gonna say when we were watching that, I was like, "Everyone, shut up! Everyone, shut up! Watch this! Watch it! <laughs> yeah, do it!" I was uh, watching this moment with David, and um, he was talking to me about it later. Uh, he was going to say, one of my favorite parts uh, in the movie is whenever it's revealed that it was a real memory. And I was, I knew exactly what he was going to say before he said it, because it was one of my favorite parts, too. It just shows that he, that first time that he's showing his real emotions, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and it's kind of an outburst of anger. He's flipping a chair and yeah. just mm-hmm. cursing and, and screaming. And, and uh, you did not expect that. And yeah, you, and get it really, sen- you get the sense that that's years of just yeah. bottled up emotion. Up. Like he's yeah. finally able to, not willingly, but he had to let it go. Like yeah. it was just forced out of him. So. And uh, it really shows uh, like how good of an actor Ryan mm. Gosling is. He's a chill on a my great arms performer. when I watched yeah. that the first time. Yeah, he's a, Actually, you can do a lot. Time. You can do a lot with a little type of actor. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that, I, I think um, it not only speaks to us emotionally, but just to very human issues where, for instance, there were kids that would grow up being told that 
they're worthless or not like everyone else and they'll be surrounded by people constantly telling you that and if enough people are telling you the same thing over and over again you believe it yourself so in this situation when you're considering that he's actually human being told he's a replicant you're a slave you're a servant to us you don't have your own thoughts you don't have your own emotions this is Mm -hmm. your life and then suddenly realizing that all those emotions you could have had that life you could have had was validated it was robbed it was taken but you weren't able to pursue that because everyone was keeping that out of your like your realm of options then yeah just imagine the (laughs) volatile reaction afterwards Mm -hmm. that you would give yeah Yeah. they did uh they did such a good uh job with um his character and i have to say that i appreciate his role more so than i do deckard yeah in um the first one i Mm. i want to talk about how his emotions affected that scene but on the flip side, I can't remember her name again, but the designer who was in there. Dr. Oh. Anna Staline. Staline. Yeah. yeah. D- D- Staline. When she's working with that contraption to build memories, that's her job. She's a contractor to build memories for the Wallace Corp as well as I'm sure other places. Um, but while it's showing her using that and showing the finger movements and you see the different um, memories as she's building them, I don't like, did that impact anyone else or yeah, like, how could you do that any better in anything yeah. else? Like and that's like, yeah, the what? birthday cake. It was so poignant. It was so beautiful. It just, and mm-hmm. it made you believe yeah. that she's building actual like dreams and memories. And I it don't makes know. you wonder okay. how they could do that. But what? then you watch it happen. Like somehow they came up with a way to make that work. Yeah. And that, that what actress I, uh... is, that actress is Carla jury, by the mm-hmm. way. And I oh. think one of my favorite things about this is that, ult- first of all, ultimately in the end, he is, actually a replicant and he's not the the real (laughs) child real boy really he's not a real boy (laughs) but she in essence granted him his humanity in that Mm. scene because whether it was a truth or a lie even whether it was his memory or not it was that breaking point where he he had that emotion had that emotional outburst and Mm. uh he he pretty much accepted in that moment that he is human and then whether he realizes it that that he's fake or not, it changes his character for the rest of the movie. I least. agree. Mm-hmm. So Joy requests to be put on the Emanator and taken with. She wants to go with Kay. I don't. I don't think that explains it well enough because he was already capable of putting her on that. I think it was more of keeping her there with no backup at yeah. home. Like he broke her yeah. ability Migrating all the to data. stay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, this is another thing getting trying to push you into thinking that maybe joy is like sentient yeah. in some way well yeah she's uh essentially risking her life to yeah you know, with or him. go be with like him. a real girl mm-hmm. i think yeah. that was that part was kind of put there to convey that well maybe she isn't really uh just a program you know yeah it's just uh, so many layers to this movie so many little aspects that i feel like are so fully fleshed out but occupy small spaces Mm -hmm. you could talk about each of them individually for a long period of time yeah Yeah, it's it's crazy you can't look down from this movie you're going to miss something it's just every every line is calculated every character calculated uh yeah i wouldn't Um, wouldn't cut a single scene this probably i don't think that the wikipedia goes over it uh but it goes over the uh, sex scene the uh virtual overlay i meant to talk about that too that was Cool and trippy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, trippy was the word I was going to use. Special effects, cool. But it yeah. makes sense, which also yeah. does play more into the, she's a real, I don't know, she has almost that. Emotions. Emotion, yeah. yeah. It's, she's an AI, but she actually is thinking beyond herself. She's trying to, yeah, overcome Strangely her limitations. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but what a visual, like, feat. Another, another one, this movie's just one after the other, just like, I think this follows pretty closely after that memory scene. And yeah. So Ryan Gosling, I did read about it. He had to film two scenes. The actresses are both there. He's just standing there, and they he's he filmed one with Ana de Armas and the other one with Mackenzie Davis, oh. and they kind of just overlaid the performances. But it's I I can't I can't imagine how hard it would be to make one person's face look like two faces. It was one of those things where you'd see more of Anna at times and more of Mackenzie at times, mm-hmm. but it always looked like they were kind of 
joined in a Mm -hmm. weirdly natural yet also unnatural way. Well, and seeing the know. hand movements where they're, they looked like they were synced. Yeah, she said she's literally synchronizing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that's, it was, it was it, mo- it's yeah. really a good sign that this movie like has that several of these things, like the dream weaving stuff, this um, even like, you know, kind of migrating her data from the home hub to the little portable thing as if, you know, they're not already tracking them anyway. But it's a good sign that I have pretty much absolute suspension of disbelief where I'm a little bit more of a pessimistic, cynical person that always kind of picks apart and nitpicks movies like that. That wouldn't be real. That wouldn't happen. This movie mm-hmm. that like maybe flit my flitted in my mind, like once or twice, just ever so slightly. And it's really a good sign. A movie really does its job at, you know, that suspension of disbelief. Even when we have mm-hmm. like miraculous technology like this. Yeah. Yes. Uh, like you don't understand how it would ever work, but you're also not meant to. But they're yeah. conveying it in a way that seems like realistic to what 30 years from now would probably be. Who yeah. knows? I'm glad you brought this part up because I would have skipped it. But I do think this is a, also another good sign of Joy being sentient. And this is when Kay isn't even in the room. He's in the kitchen. But he oh, basically yeah. dismisses... Mackenzie and said, "We're I'm I'm done with you." Yeah. No, no, no. That wasn't him. That was her. That was well, George. Yeah. No, it was her. That's what I said. No, you said him. Mackenzie oh, retorts back, and here could be actually a, a kicker too. She says, "Yeah, you know, basically, hush. I've been inside you. There's not much there." And which, if yeah. you say that Joy is the subconscious of K, and there's not much there that he's not human, and she mm-hmm. knows that. So I mean, there's still multiple layers of the onion here you can peel back. Yep, it's crazy. Yeah, but w- when you really boil it down, she's a hologram. What are you going to feel sinking with well, a hologram? Well, unless she did <laughs> get to feel something when they were synced. Like it's a two no, it's a two-way street, I think. I would if there I'm is, just kind of joking. Although we're all just kind of guesstimating here yeah. anyway cuz who knows what actually is happening. I know. Uh, we right. also see Mackenzie slip a tracker in Kay's jacket here, which is kind of important. Yes. A little bit. It's a little bit of a red herring. Yeah. Uh so we also have Speaking of, no, I'll, I'll get into it later. But we also, let's talk about Las Vegas and Deckard. Yeah, I didn't know the so. Oracle from NeverEnding Story was in this. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, they're not looking as good. Actually, you know, not bad. <laughs> and when I think about it, when I think back on it, actually not bad. <laughs> um, but I love the, the pivot from blues to oranges mm-hmm. as we go to this just... The city that has been consumed by the desert. Las or, Vegas. Yeah, and Las Vegas, well, it looks exactly how you would imagine yeah. a Las Vegas would look like in the... the Dystopian. The, yeah. yeah, it's got these monolithic Future kind of to apocalypse. They're uh, overbuilt. Or like you still have the Luxor Pyramid there, but it's yeah. overbuilt with another attachment on top of it. Everything's just yes. grandiose to the max. You've got the what you could imagine used to be the glitz and the glam of mm-hmm. what was happening there, but it's all just... Ruin, said, basically. And strangely yeah. reminds me of Dune. A little uh, bit. Yeah, you can imagine that, 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 sure those ki- that color scheme and the... Sand and... Sand, well, the color palette calls know. back to the original, which kind of had that steel green um, and contrasted with the orange. And then you obviously mm-hmm. have the movie poster of this with the half and half steel green yes. and orange. Yeah. And I do have an interesting color observation to make at the end of this movie. So. Reese, you're all about those colors. No, it's important. Yeah. I, I yeah. do... I do wonder what you guys are thinking when he is walking into Vegas for the first time and he finds the beehive. Oh yeah, and he sticks his hand in there. Is, is, I, I don't a, know if they ever really explain. I have that, kind but. of an insight on well, that. Yeah, oh, do you? Ahead, no. It's a. It's like that. That same uh, to be human type thing. So uh, in the first one, remember how they're always sticking their hands in the ice cold water yes. or the boiling water, whatever it is, and they feel nothing. But here he's sticking his hand in a beehive where he would feel pain, and it's kind oh, of not like necessarily. a. He's he's testing. Well, you know, that's what he's it's kind of like you he's and putting I his hand this, in Noah. there, and the it's, thing is, uh, it's a curiosity. You know, it's like will I feel pain? Am mm-hmm. I human? Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah, I get it. In addition to that, it's also a miraculous appearance of something that's been extinct, um, because yeah. in the first they talk about you know all the the birds and the insects are all extinct because of the radiation. And hey, here's a full apiary with you know bees oh. everywhere swarming, and it's just like this is unheard of. Um, yeah, it also throws and, back to that flower that he finds uh, next to the tree too. Yeah, and mm-hmm. you all know specifically that apiary, someone has to tend that. It doesn't just you know you know mm-hmm. take care of itself. So that means someone is in this outskirts here taking care of the bees here. 
Yeah, um, sign of signs of life. Right. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah. All right. So Deckard. So I remember watching the first one the other week and and remembering back on this where they have K meet Deckard. The hotel they're in definitely gave me vibes of the building uh, in the final scenes of the um, original one. Although I know now watching both of them back to back, very different. But yeah, this was kind of like a con- casino almost uh, restaurant. It's a lounge. Room. So it's a, I mean, yeah. I don't know if you've been to Vegas or not, but you have an all in one, all like. I have not. So you've got giant casinos, hotels, you know, lounge you know, experiences, everything to do entertainment wise. Uh, all in one place so you know you walk through the casino to get to your room there's a lounge there's smoking drinking gambling uh food bank like just buffets like it's just entertainment to the max just gluttony like everything in excess and i thought it was just awesome just seeing kind of the decay side of that but still that human built grandeur still kind of staying Mm -hmm. you know and then he throws on the i don't know if the wikipedia talks about the fight yet or not Yes, uh, we're we're at that. Okay, yeah. I mean, so, when he walks into the lounge and just throws on the lights and the music, and it was just that. I love this scene. I, I love it. Th- this is like my, in terms of action sequences, if you can call them that. This is my second favorite action sequence. Just the light play, as you said, and the interspliced music turning on and off, and it's kind of like has a stop start. Mm-hmm. It's a stuttery momentum that's really disorienting but also very choreographed at the same mm-hmm. time mm-hmm. it's in the visual i i just love it i think via nueve has a way of taking something that in other movies could be a simple scene it could be more about the fight it could be simple they could have done that anywhere yeah but for some reason he he's like you know what we need a elvis you know hologram in the background we need uh the drama of the lights and the music cutting in and out it's just this is actually a a credit to the editor though uh joe walker yeah i think denis i read that he was going to cut this scene because it was just so complex and difficult to make work but the editor i guess took it home or spent extra time on it tinkered with it and kind of made it I'm glad he did. Just I'm right. Glad he That's did. really yeah. strange because it's one of my favorite yeah. scenes in this. Yeah, I, know. I told David that. Oh yeah. yeah. What What do you like about it, Irina? Like, I I know, but for me, it's it's I like seeing the craziness, the holograms and stuff. But I think it's just an unusual setting for a fight scene that is not really used in anything else, and kind of um almost a uh, throws you off because when you think of Elvis and you think of the location. That's usually, like we've mentioned before, the glitz and glamour. It's a different era. But to have a whole slugging out in the middle of this kind of empty, uh, haunted room, essentially, is a a very unique setting for a fight scene. Especially the way they cut the audio in and out, Mm -hmm. where you can hear the punches and it's dead silent and there there are noises. And then all of a sudden, you you can't hear anything but like the audio. The combination of dead silence and then jarring music cutting yeah. back and forth and it's yeah. going up and down and fascinating the whole fight the the contrast between deckard's ability and k's ability as a replicant yeah. uh, you know the top of the line replicant you know deckard's full you know haymakers swinging at him giving him everything he got he's old yeah. granted but he's you know a force to be reckoned with and uh he gets thrown across the room and then k's just kind of taking the punches on the chin like a champ because yeah. he's obviously physically superior and he's just like, basically, are you done? I'd rather, you know, talk about this. Yeah. yeah. And, and then I'm Decker just like, be this is my me. favorite song. Yeah. Just, <laughs> and, yeah. What Another, a great uh, transition. Interesting uh, component and a, like an additional complexity to the scene is uh, the fact that Kay in this moment is thinking about uh, the fact that this could be his father or not. Or Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, something Whatever. you don't really think about. Or even, and, uh, even if it isn't, he's going to have some answer yeah. to what he is. Yeah. So you can tell just throughout this, he's you know probably pondering over the fact that uh, yeah. like this is a really existential matter. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, De- so he can't is- pull the wrong punches here. And then after the scene, Deckard does reveal that he is he was with Rachel and they they had a kid. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They had a child. Uh, so this does in. K's mind make him be- almost believe, I guess, that Deckard might be his father. Yeah, that was almost a hundred. I feel like it for him, it showed that it was to him a hundred percent fact. Like that, yeah. that kind of set it in stone. Yeah, Gosh. and this is when you feel knowing the whole movie, you feel 
kind of bad for him. I know. He <laughs> he is a very uh, tragic character. Yeah. I like that little lounge scene they have where they At the bar. share a drink. Yeah. Well, the, yeah, well, he pours the Johnny all... Walker with the special bottle, the futuristic bottle that was in the original movie, too, and the mm-hmm. that he poured, too, the same bottle looking thing. It was kind of a cool callback. Yes. And right. I, like, I like Dickard's intro, too. He's like, you know, when he first sees Kay, he's like, you might happen to have a piece of cheese about you now, would you, boy? Which is a line mm-hmm. from Treasure Island said by Ben mm-hmm. Gunn, who is marooned on an island. So it's like, I don't know. It's really cool. The, the, the involvement of the literature and just the yeah. ease of, like, I expected Harrison Ford to kind of have a cameo role in this, almost like, you know, Hugh Jackman and Logan popping up in X-Men stuff wherever, not uh-huh. necessarily. But I really glad that he was more of a full-fledged figure in this yeah they wanted him also, to be like a lead through the third act of the movie yeah also uh with that uh treasure island quote <laughs> do you think that that was kind of a uh you know a, a line that was meant to be like a you know an authentication uh question that's like are you human will you recognize this as something right yeah i got that i got that you know for sure. are you okay or are you part of the machine uh, robotic kind of society that's going to kill me yeah like a challenge question for you know yeah and he passed all right let's uh next paragraph but he still punched him a bunch of times <laughs> <laughs> love kills joshi and tracks k to las vegas she kidnaps deckard destroys joy and leaves k to die the replicant freedom movement rescues k when their leader fresa tells him that she helped deliver rachel's child and that her child was actually a girl, Kay understands that he is not Rachel's child, deduces that Staline is her daughter, and that the memory of the toy horse is hers, one she implanted amongst those of other replicants whose memories she designed. To prevent Deckard from leading Wallace to Staline or the freedom movement, Fresa asks Kay to kill Deckard for the greater good of all replicants. So, we uh, so we're kind of rewinding a little bit to go back to the death of Joshi before we then fast forward back. Uh, what did y'all think of that scene? Well, it almost so puts Freysa as a foil for Joshi because Freysa here is saying, hey, kill this person for the greater good. Yeah, she mm-hmm. does kind of just pass the baton, doesn't she? <laughs> yeah, jo- you're, Joshi is uh, Robin Wright, correct? Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, gosh, the most painful scene. Yeah, I, I couldn't help the whole time. Just I can't I remember what was being away. discussed. I was just thinking about how much it would be hurt, how yeah. much hurt, it would hurt to have a glass crushed in your own yep. hand. I know, and then like... <laughs> like continuously squeezed you can't recoil and take that pain away it's just yeah that's a very powerful scene and that's <laughs> that posed the question of like oh is this good or bad like between these two characters and that's what where, where for me at least i was more on joshi's side yeah. yeah i'd have to say this is this is more the moment where to me it was confirmed that she was ultimately a more on the good side kind of character because of the fact that she pretty much stands up to her for K. Yeah. And is like, nope, I'm not gonna uh, you know, break here. I will yeah. I will die for You gotta do this. what you gotta do. Yeah. Uh this is another moment of us realizing that love has human qualities. Her she her anger gets the best of her uh, at yeah. multiple moments. Mm-hmm. Where she Yeah. It it's just yeah. it's, it goes against her well, yeah, they're we said that the again, replicants where, um, becoming more love kills human. joy. Mm-hmm. Hey, like that's yeah. just uh, murder. Like it's uh, you feel like someone just got murdered, and it's just that hatred that you know that boiling, seething rage that you know human is known to be. You know, it's a, a flaw of humanity, and it's like here it is in a replicant as well. <sighs> yeah. This is the moment where she lost me because throughout the uh, throughout the movie you could you could say there's a complexity to her character that she's doing it for kind of her cause uh her cause but then she, wants she to be the best yeah exactly <laughs> okay. her her point here then is uh after ki- she kills Joshi and then she kills Joy essentially yeah and uh both of those you have to say at this point man there is no way that uh she's actually good or she actually I only felt mildly yeah. sorry for her at the beginning, but she goes mm-hmm. full, she goes full tilt like yeah berserk. Yeah. It's mode. almost oh, like yeah. you with her character. It's like you have to kind of blame her creator to a certain extent because, as with anything, a lot of what makes who they are is what creates them. So she is an offspring of this Wallace's character. So right. he probably only taught her 
these feelings and she's basically replicating what he himself has yeah yeah at the same time she's doing more than just orders because you know yeah going over and stepping on joy's emanator is just complete malice it's pure malice it's oh, unnecessary yeah. there's there's nothing practical yeah. about it yeah she did not feel like a replicant to me i mean the amount of anger that she had in this whole movie was almost beyond any other character in this movie i don't think there is anybody who's more angry than her <laughs> she's angry <laughs> you established oh, yeah. that oh yeah <laughs> Um, uh, speaking of emotion, the reveal when Frace is talking to Kay and he's sitting down and you see on his face as she's still talking, you know, there's no word spoken by Kay yet. And she says uh, the word she instead of he. And you see the realization dawn on Kay's face and it just your stomach drops because you see the color come out of his face. And it's just like, wow, like he was just yeah, hit over the head, you know. Yeah. Yeah. At first he was he was broken to realize that he might be a child and then he was you could tell throughout the course of this he was starting to come around to the idea and actually you know start to feel a sense of hope and yeah a positive outlook of his situation and like oh this i'm i'm special yeah mm-hmm. and that kind of invalidated what he felt was special but i do feel like they build it kind of back up so yeah, yeah the, these uh these two moments there, well, there are two moments where that we haven't covered yet that uh, K displays this emotionality that is really uh, subtle, or the micro expressions are really uh, poignant, and it's uh, the scene where he's uh, being interrogated again, and he's doing the whole intersected. Uh, they're asking the question, and he fails it, but you can. He's kind of trembling, and his. He's more nervous or he he's, his thoughts are elsewhere. He's emotional. And then later when he's told that everyone uh, thinks that they're the, uh, oh, the one you miracle. Oh, you you were yeah. a child. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We and all he did. realizes that he's not and he just, you know, has this look on his face. Uh, just, it's kind of, it's almost a denial of his existence. But uh, at the same time, he's still going to do what he thinks is right. I, I like agree. the stylistic choice of having Freysa missing her eye, uh, mm-hmm. obviously because yeah, she, she plucked it out herself because that's the serial number indicator that she's a replicant, like if someone's hunting her. Yeah, mm-hmm. that or she survived a, right. an attack. Do you think that's <laughs> somewhat of an allusion to Odin taking out his eye for the sake of knowledge? Could Maybe. Be. Whoa. I mean, the, <laughs> well, the eyes are a general motif in general for the whole these two films. So, yeah, I mean, yeah but, can, it, but it but it's specifically one eye, and Odin takes out... Uh, one eye in Norse mythology in the pursuit of being, you know, the all father and knowing everything. Yeah. It is the same um, side of the face that to uh, see all. Morton had, you know, when he scanned his serial number and then he plucks the eye out and gets back in the spinner to yeah. upload to headquarters. So, yeah. but yeah, I mean, there's just, definitely symbolism there that, you know, she's basically representing the knowledge of come that replicants are their own humanity, so to speak, and rising up. All right, let's close out the story. Sure. Love takes Deckard to Wallace Corporation headquarters to meet Wallace. Wallace offers Deckard a clone of Rachel in exchange for revealing what he knows. Deckard refuses, and the clone is killed. As Love transports Deckard to be tortured and interrogated off-world, Kay intercepts Love's shuttle and tries to rescue Deckard. He fights Love and manages to drown her, but he is mortally wounded. He stages Deckard's death to protect him from Wallace and the replicant freedom movement before taking Deckard to Stellene's office, handing her his toy horse. As Kay lies motionless on the steps, looking up at the snowing sky, Deckard enters the building and meets his daughter for the first time. And credits. So, Deckard's conversation about... with Wallace? <sighs> they... Yes. Yeah. And how well they did that, uh, the CGI on Rachel. Yeah, I thought it was almost flawless. They, yeah, they did a crazy good job with that. Well, I know there was I a think... uh, another voice actress who was a, a sound alike to Sean. Mm-hmm. What's her last name? That played Rachel in the, the first original one. Rachel. Yeah, uh, yeah. And I, I don't know if they actually used an actri- actress as a base for the um, Rachel in this as well. But it was yeah. So her body was an actress, and her face was completely constructed through uh, CGI. Mm-hmm. That's you were going to say something, David. Oh, I was just going to say when I. I watched this movie before the first movie, right? So I saw yeah. Blade Runner 2049 first, and I knew that she was from the first one, but I never watched it. So the right. impact wasn't as heavy 
rewatching this movie after seeing the first one, like, oh. oh my gosh, that made this way more impactful. Yeah. This like, scene man, became a lot more important. than what it was. I knew yeah. it was big before. Mm-hmm. I just couldn't feel the same weight. This solidified it for yeah. me. Yeah. yeah. Even and before Rachel as, physically walks in, like just the voice recording of the first conversation that they have, and you see with the owl yeah. record as this grizzled person just kind of start choking up. I almost yeah. thought that was more effective, the actual uh, recording to me, than seeing her come in because kind of weird. my mind knew that she was CG. Yeah, and Harrison but, Ford did this really well. But yeah, just hearing great. that recording. And yeah, he, do, he actually does a good job displaying the emotionality of hearing her voice again after like their first interaction again after so many years. Uh, and it's so disturbing how quickly Wallace is able to just dispatch his replicants mm-hmm. like once yeah. he's done with them you just know oh, well that didn't serve my purpose you're it's also, dead it's like, it's it's sad and cool at the same time how deckard i believe at least knew what was going to happen to her but had to stand up for what he believed in anyways yeah and he actually told a lie just to get under wallace's skin her eyes were yeah. green eyes were green yeah her eyes mm-hmm. were green yeah yeah when her eyes actually were in fact brown and the the uh clone he made was true it was truly I, I can't say that he actually did this, but in my brain, when I think back on that scene, I can just see Jared uh, uh, Leto's eye twitch. Just like, yeah, I, 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 <laughs> just like, oh, I hate you. Yeah. <laughs> but like before that, when he brings Rachel out, he's like, you think all I have to offer is pain. Only I know you love pain. Pain to remind you of the joy that you felt was real. More joy then. Mm-hmm. So he brings Rachel out. Then, you know, Deckard rejects her and he says, you do not know what pain is yet. You will learn. So just like the uh, carrot and the stick there and, it kind of shows just how maniacal this character is, Wallace. I also want to say, or maybe I'm just looking too far into it. I think this is another subtle sign that Deckard could be a replicant, and it's because of his showing of emotion versus his lack thereof. Because mm-hmm. he he cries, and the only people in these movies that show emotion really are the replicants. Oh. I mean, to a degree. I mean, I think. I think um, Joshi kind of shows human qualities. But she really does hold it in quite a bit. Yeah. Like when she, her hand is being crushed with the glass, she's just not, she's almost expressionless, even though you know she's feeling pain. Yeah. Yeah. This is me probably just looking too far no, into I it. No, I think it's valid, I, okay. valid uh, questioning. I, the only thing yeah. would be maybe what's the representation here, how many people are actually human that we're seeing in the movie, but... It's a valid question, yeah. and they do have the conversation alluding to that that question, human or replicant, again. And I don't know if you want me to read that conversation. I, I wrote it down. Well, no, go for no, it. Uh, so, real quick, though, not only that, Reese, I actually think this is one of those movies where we can delve as deep as we want, and we probably still won't be able to delve as deep as the creators of it yeah, did. Because there's never supposed to be a definitive answer. Yeah. It's just to get. It's meant to make you think. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, sorry they, about that. They Andrew, wrote it. Ahead. No, you're good. They wrote it specifically to reinforce the ambiguity here. So we start with Wallace, you know, interrogating Deckard. He says, did it never occur to you? That's why you were summoned in the first place. Designed to do nothing short of fall for her right then and there. Mm-hmm. All to make that single perfect specimen. That is, if you were designed. Love or mathematical precision. Yes. No. And then Deckard responds with, I know what is real. Yes. That that is okay. Yes. What that is a beautiful line actually. I'm glad you brought that up because even still it doesn't necessarily state that he was a replicant or not. It could just be a belief in uh you know some form of destiny whether human or replicant. Right. And see here so I this, think that's a really cool. Yeah, it calls line. back to my personal opinion of when the first one I wanted them to straddle the fence and stay that way instead of committing. And I think this is, granted, they only really touched on this a little bit in this the second movie here, but I thought this was the perfect straddling the fence and inviting you to have the discussion versus telling you which way it is. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so then we cut to the seawall chase, which I think is my favorite action sequence, the crowning jewel How could it of this be? movie. Uh, uh, sequence with the music and just... How it's it's just this dreamlike, but also chaotic, just action. It's so intense. And when you're watching him fight this person that you built a hatred for the whole movie, they mm-hmm. finally show 
I don't know what kind of character K is when he when he already realizes that he isn't human and that he I mean in a way could be on love side I guess if he really wanted to mm-hmm. I don't know I just I thought they did a really good job of finally ending their conflict yeah and the best way to yeah do it. the darkness and the light and the crashing chaos of the waves and the depth and just the struggle is yeah I love this kind of when he find when they down the ship and they're both like kind of just amongst the waves fighting tooth and nail. One thing I observed, and I don't, it could be intentional, also not, but if you notice, this is the first time that the stark blues that you see in the first movie is juxtaposed against the orange, and the orange, of, and it, the orange is projected from the tail light of that uh, spinner. spinner, but uh, love is always like behind the orange, and... Uh, K is very much blue, like tinted in blue. And I was like, oh, well, I wonder if that means something. So I looked up like meaning color codes and what meanings behind colors. And uh, red is generally associated with energy, passion, love, desire, <laughs> speed, love. strength, power, heat, aggression, danger, fire, blood, war, violence, and all things intense and passionate. While blue is peace, tranquility, calm, Cold, stability, harmony, unity, trust, truth. Whoa. Which I would say those are very, you know, identifiable to both of mm-hmm. those characters. And once I was very focused on, because I, I already looked it up, and then I was going to see how the fight resolved to see if the orange or the red tint goes away after she dies, and it does. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, you, see, you don't see the orange or the red tint there any mm-hmm. longer. That's really uh, cool. So I, I just thought that was interesting. Gosh, I'm, they put so much thought into every bit of this movie. That's insane. Yeah. I took yeah. that from the, a site called incredibleart.org, the symbolism of color article. So I'll just call that out real quick. But Man. No, I'm right there with you because I actually wrote down the same thing with the lights on each person. <laughs> really? Yeah. It's awesome that you saw that too because I was yeah, hoping that I wasn't just that. reading too yeah. into it. Well, um, the color in this movie is never unintentional, it seems. The, well, everything in this is calculated. Yeah. Uh, so Kay takes Deckard to see his daughter at, after the resolution of this fight. Uh, what'd y'all think of the ending of this movie? Well, you get the musical score that's the the theme mm. of the Blade Runner yes. theme that really brings you back to yeah, the first brings it and back. wraps it up. Yep, uh, really hits uh, home. Another uh, really cool thing about this is how just after that moment where um, Kay learns that he's not special. Kay is special. Okay, Noah. okay. So here's the thing. He's special in one way, but he's not. He, he's an actual replicant, but the point being, he's completely downtrodden and, you know, his existence, uh, well, it sucks now. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, in his brief perspective. Yeah. Um, I mean, he's and he decides, died. all right, I'm going to do the right thing anyways. I'm going to save, I'm going to save Deckard, let him see his kid. It gives and, him a purpose. Yeah. Yeah. And the thing is, he even, uh, he... But not only did he give uh, Deckard a purpose, but he like uh, he finds his own that's separate from the replicants. Yeah, he finds and separate, meaning, meaning in his own life. Yeah, yeah, and separate from the human side of things, or sorry, the um, Wallace's side of things. And he decides to go save Harrison Ford rather than kill him, or Deckard rather than kill him. And uh, yeah, because he can. He's like, you did drown there. Yeah, like, you, you did. You did drown you there, new life. and in order daughter. to let him be with his uh, kid at last, mm-hmm. because he had never seen him before. Yes. And I thought that was a that was a beautiful motive, and he ends his life to kind of save two others. Yeah, it's or, a, as far as you're aware, it's a selfless act. Which you know, as far as we know thematically, humanity is the only thing capable of something selfless, because any mm-hmm. kind of base animal is driven by instinct to do you know, what they need to do to survive. And so mm-hmm. that really just kind of pulls out that, you know, there's humanity even in the replicant or, you know, even the mm-hmm. replicants are more human than humans themselves. More human than human. I think this is what makes this more such a human unique central human. character and almost a, one of the better of most films that I've seen. I think he displays a whole unique character arc where you start off with something that is complacent. They believe they're a replicant, maybe slightly curious, maybe questioning the system ever so slightly, but overall just a servant. 
Yeah. A cog. And coming to a point where there's a little bit of hope thinking maybe there is something more to this. Maybe I was justified in some of my rebellious nature. Mm -hmm. Then having that shattered, realizing you aren't, and going through this whole anger, disbelief, and just basically pure rage up to a point where he's become okay with it. Like he, he knows what he is and he's come to terms with that where char- the character love hasn't. Yeah. I think she's still grappling with that existence dilemma and not to mention an abusive creator. Yes. And so <laughs> the, having those two rival and the one that is coming to terms with who he is winning out in the end is deeply symbolic. Yeah. Yeah. Especially after seeing him hit rock bottom where Mm -hmm. he comes back into the city and is immediately faced with the larger than life hologram Mm -hmm. of the joy ad, um, where he realizes that this someone that he possibly loved, um, was a big meaning to his life is just kind of now seemingly meaningless. And then, you know, he looks at his blaster. You almost think he's going to, you know, commit suicide or something like that. It's, and then he turns around and does something selfless immediately after hitting rock bottom himself. So Right. Mm-hmm. All right. That closes the story. Indeed. That was our longest one, I'm pretty sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, yeah. It was a good talk. <laughs> I do wish that they got one little line there at the end where Kay is, like, in the snow and just has, like, a, a three-sentence... No. Well, I, I, I wouldn't be I happy with that. Like, no <laughs> falling with onto the Decker ground. asked him, you know, what am I to you? And Kay just smiles yeah. at him. Yeah. yeah. You know, uh, talking about these movies, every single, oh, well, <laughs> almost every single movie we watch, if it's at least half decent, I respect them so much more after we talk about them I know. than I do before, I know. because there are so many different insights into them. That's why our scores always them. end up going up at the end. Yeah, it's like, I know. Actually, I think we'll usually, adjust this. <laughs> yeah, usually I stick to the same score, yeah. uh, but it still, it gives me a lot of respect for movie makers in yeah. general. Anyway, let's close the book on this, and we will see y'all on the other side where we give this movie our reviews with a uh, score and also talk about this franchise as a whole. Welcome back. We're here to talk about Blade Runner 2049. Give it our reviews and our scores. David has our scores in a, a little, little box, box here. A little, on little pieces of paper. This could be randomized. And after that, we'll talk about this franchise. But why don't you pull one of those? Take it away, David. Right you are, David. Here I go, David. First score. AJ. With, with a 10. What? Yep. Bow, 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 bow. Yeah. Pew, 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 pew. <laughs> All right. So if you listen to last episode, I wasn't, let's just say I was maybe preaching heresy with my not <laughs> lauding Blade Runner as the masterpiece as it is. But um, you did still give it a nine. Yeah. So I think it's also might be heresy in people's opinion to give this a higher score than the original. I can and imagine that, honestly. I went back and forth on giving a 10 here. And I think all of us, or at least those of us who have given 10 so far on different things kind of make the caveat is doesn't necessarily mean everything's hundred percent perfect, yes. um, but it still is deserving of a 10 because, you know, I'm a critical person. I, I nitpick things. I just maybe because I have no feelings and emotions because I'm a re- replicant, but I could <laughs> not find any notable criticism for this movie. And this is a movie with Jared Leto in it. Um, <laughs> so I just, I love the visuals. I love the, symbolism. I mean, all that stuff really speaks to me. And then we also have a thought-provoking story that is masterfully uh, done in homage to the original, but also stands alone on its own uh, two feet. Um, And I think it's actually harder to do right by something so tremendously respected as the first Blade Runner um, and not, you know, tarnish its name. And that's to everyone involved in this movie's credit. Just the characters, what this did better than the original, it didn't have some of those bizarro elements, you know, and it also pulled me in more emotionally. I feel like, you know, in contrast to the first one where the most emotional part was the tears in the rain speech at the very end, 
I felt like I was involved, invested emotionally uh, in Kay and the other characters, you know, pretty much from the get-go. And I thought the use of joy as kind of a sounding board of subconscious, but also questioning, is this, you know, and another character in their own right um, was something that was actually very deep once I really looked into this from a critical lens. Um, mm. And this this movie just checks all of the boxes where I can dig into it, sink my teeth into it. I also can just kind of sit back and watch it. It did drag on a little bit, unfortunately, pace-wise, but I can forgive that because of the substance. Um, and it's kind of necessary for this kind of movie to have such, you know, thoughtful presence behind it. And, you know, especially where they run kind of out of source material, you know, and the, the first movie diverged from the source material quite a bit anyway, but this is original yet done respectfully to its predecessor. Um, yeah, it's and it its really own vision fulfills while it. also being yeah. very faithful. Um, yeah. and there's some elements in the book too, like Joy, you know, kind of being an emotional sounding board kind of represents a little bit in my mind. The There's something called like the mood organ in the book where you dial a number and it literally alters your mood. Uh, so there was some, mm -hmm. some of that element too, but just this movie is, is beautiful, both visually, thematically, emotionally, and, you know, you still get good action and good delivery performances by some amazing cast, um, and good writing from crew. And the soundtrack is, is it's Hans Zimmer and it's really, it's, it's, it's just a meaningful movie to me. Um, so yeah, it, it deserves a 10. Awesome. Next one. Wow. Ooh. Ooh, it is me. And I gave it a 9.5. Wow. Well, the thing is, and I'm going to say, I'm going to bump mine up to a 10. Ooh. Cool. It, it was a thought-provoking conversation. Yeah, <laughs> and beforehand, I real, I've been thinking about this for days, whether or not I was going to give this like a 9 or a 10, 9.5. Mm -hmm. um, I am the kind of person who does not want to give something a 10. Yep unless it is the biggest masterpiece on the planet. It's, it is hard for me to give it a 10, um, which is why I aim for a 9.5. But just, you're right, I guess after all the thought-provoking uh, conversation, the, the deeper meanings behind it, there I can't flaw it. I loved everything about it. I rewatch it. And it's one of those movies where I would not normally think it would be a rewatchable movie. Mm -hmm. But I've enjoyed every minute, every time I've watched it. Next right. up. Next Noah with a 9.52. Yeah. So, like David, I have to bump this one up. I, I Because, uh, uh, put simply, I didn't watch it the first time in the greatest situation. Uh, yeah, that wasn't what I wanted for you. Yeah. But the thing is, I, I did watch it, and I... Um, intently. I admired a lot of... Yeah, intently. And I admired a lot about it, but just uh, talking about it just shows all the depth uh, and uh, insight that that went into this movie and it's just a it is in its own right a masterpiece mm -hmm. just as much as uh the first blade runner so i have to i have to bump that up to a 10 all right next score who's gonna break the streak we have Irina, who's not breaking the streak we have a 10 <laughs> yes. yes we have a 10 oh gosh mostly for points already made I feel like I'm just going to be echoing everything yep. else I know. everyone yep. else says. You can speak longer than us, though. Again, it's just I can't think of a way to improve it more, even though I had a problem with Jared Leto. I, I think that is a very small inconsistency with the rest of the film, which is basically perfect, in my opinion. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, so I give it a 10. Okay, Arena, I know that it's an inconsistency. But the water was the real. Water, though, I will yeah. fight Think you about on this. the water. Jared Leto did Suicide Squad a year before this. Dude, the, the, <laughs> that water at least, just by itself, at least gives this movie a seven. Mm -hmm. Rewatchability water. <laughs> Rewatchability water. All right. Yeah. All right. And <laughs> oh, oh, my gosh. Reese gave this a 10. <laughs> oh. I'm actually going to have to bump it down. No. no, no. I'm just, I'm just, <laughs> uh, seven. So this movie, I was I knew going into this series that this will be my this will be my ten, but I was still opening. I was still open to like I don't know, giving it, taking, looking at it in a, through a different lens. But it's it's impossible not to go with that score for this movie because it just does so much right. And Denny Villanueva was actually quoted that after the fact, after this movie was made, that he he was kind of just 
stunned. He 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 realized he made the most expensive indie movie ever, mm-hmm. and he was also asked if he would if there was going to be multiple cuts like there was for the original Blade Runner. He was like, "No, I I made the movie I wanted to make. This is awesome. it. Like this is the the one. Like it's and that never happens with big budget movies mm-hmm. like this. And this is a big budget movie. How many times can you say that you went to go see a summer blockbuster and you got this much out of it like this much i don't know there, this isn't like a cut scene or a theatrical release or anything like yeah is it i don't know the the value of this movie is it's one of the few ones where the dollar amount equals the output and the dollar amount for this one was huge uh everything from the the visuals to the characters to just i don't know all the themes and the symbolism everything was so calculated to the absolute maximum like I, I don't think there's anything in here that is extra fat or padding even if it does lull at times every little piece of the puzzle fits and there's nothing out of place and despite it being calculated uh, it feels organic would you say yeah oh exactly yeah. and it ad- it also adds meaning to just about every single frame it, it's there's le- there's not a frame in this movie that is just one layer. It's all these different things that you can think about and pull different ideas from. Uh, and then it all just kind of coalesces into this perfect package that you can interpret any way that you want, and it's valid. Uh, so for that, I think this is the ultimate sequel anyone could ask for to a classic movie, and it's kind of just a miracle piece, because I don't think there's any other movie out there like I, I dare you to cha- challenge me right now. Like, what movie that is thirty, forty years after its classic original is as good, if not better, than the original? Mad Max. Ending story too. <laughs> oh, that, well, no, <laughs> got you on you, that one. How did you do that? <laughs> he, okay, you, you got me on Mad Max Fury Road. I know. <laughs> Other than Mad Max Fury Road, which <laughs> I would say quickly. I hold I this to an equal standard. Ew. What else? That, um, no, that's it. Uh, I can't think of anything else. Oh, I do want to talk about Mad Max because that, <laughs> that's another case. Like, th- those oh, are yeah. two, okay, they're two miracle movies. <laughs> you just found the one why movie. this was so long after. I guess we can get with the franchise part of it, but. Yeah, uh, we'll talk about the franchise. I was just like, I know what movie Reese reveres more than any other. Yeah, I don't know why it didn't come across my I, mind. Like, I know, I know. Uh, that said, Mad Max. That said, yeah. The only caveat for Mad Max is that it had it was following up Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome, which was the weakest of the three. Yeah, but it's also uh, uh, it's also not finished yet either. So yes, there's yes. that as well. All right. So before we go into the box office stuff, let's talk about the critics. Critics on Rotten Tomatoes gave this movie an 87% oh. with an audience score of 81%. Didn't, uh, what, what is it? Is, didn't Life of Pets make about that score? No, it made like 70 something. Okay, but still, that is that, too close. But, that's like, that's like David's, uh, yeah. Tomb of the Dragon Emperor. Oh, there it is. Yeah, <laughs> I was wondering where that was going to come in. <laughs> well, we For had, the third or fourth too, time. So. Yeah. yeah, it was another, <laughs> you, two references I, to that. My, I blanked both times. Okay, hey, I'm hey, uh, David, did you see this at the theater when you worked there? <laughs> 2017 no i don't think i was there no, no not that time uh so metacritic the movie got an 81 with an audience score of 8.3 and on imdb it got an 8.0 which both for metacritic and imd that imdb that's incredibly high so that's good uh just- imdb's the the scale of imdb is weird because movies only tip or, or typically score five through 8.5, 8.5 being like the tops. There are movies that have it in the nines, but it's very few and far between. That the, Their scoring system is so weird. I still think it deserves better than that. I mean, yeah. I guess the only thing that they might be saying about it is that it does have kind of a lull throughout. Well, there, there's but, also people j- that just aren't on this movie's level. It's not like yeah. their cup of tea. It's just I could get, I get that. This is yeah. not some, this is not like you're going on your first date and it's like, hey, let's watch Blade Runner 2049. It's not as my a, cup of tea normally not, either. But Not to but disrespect a, anybody, but I feel like a lot of the critics who might be a little bit m- more in their own, own head, as a nice way of saying it, probably had the original Blade Runner up on a pedestal and it's like, oh, nothing can ever touch mm, this. That's a good yeah, point. Yeah, could, could be. All right, let's get into the box office, guys. This movie cost 
reported 150 million. There's some people that think it, or there's some reports that think it could have been up to 185 million. That's still not that much. Uh, but it seems oh, like a lot of they cut costs a bit, in a lot of areas and did a lot of things practically. So it could be either either one. I don't know. That's still lower than I would have of guessed based on some of the things I've heard. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, uh, one fifty to one eighty five million is still a lot, but you can't really compare it to Marvel and uh, those sorts of movies. This is more, I guess, on the level of Lord of the Rings as far as budget. Yeah, goes. yeah. If you do it to inflation, yeah, yeah. So, so, so given that the first Blade Runner, which was a box office disappointment, had an inflated worldwide box office of hundred and ten million. How much do you think Blade Runner 2049 made in the box office? Those of you that have not accidentally seen how much it actually made, which I'm you not... You said it was around between 150 and 180. Well, also, my yeah. usual question is, when was this released? Is this, this was fall, right? 2017 in the fall, yes. I'm going to go with a nice number that I like. 337 million. 337? 355. Yeah. I hate you. Okay. No, that's, AJ? Cl- that's, not, that's far enough. Uh, right? I know it wasn't... As successful, which obviously we don't have another one. So, you said what was the cost? One fifty, one hundred fifty to one eighty five. So I think probably sub three hundred. So two eighty five. In arena money, three hundred. Three hundred. Oh, yeah. okay. So you said two eighty, AJ. Yeah. All right, AJ wins again with two hundred fifty nine million. Wow, that low. Wow. Yeah, two hundred fifty nine oh million. Which actually, considering it's it had very good critical reviews, uh, it just had a disappointing opening. It it opened to thirty million, but it actually or thirty two, thirty three million, but it did leg it out. It tripled that domestically and got itself to ninety two million. Uh, so it saved some face, and it did at least make a good amount overseas. Not enough to be successful. It's still deemed a disappointment but it is not i wouldn't say it's an outright bomb i have to own up to this i i didn't see it in theaters and after watching both of these i am upset with my past self (laughs) (laughs) yeah and and it released in the fall which is not not as popular of a movie going season when did dunkirk come out was that christmas time dunkirk that was summer oh yeah that was like late summer august Now, I this saw this was, advertised, but I don't know how heavily it was advertised. The advertising for this was, they did not reveal a lot about it. This was very, they held this movie close to their vest what? in terms of plot and spoilers and all that. So it could have had something to do with the marketing. Do you think the casting of Ryan Gosling was a controversial thing? Because, I mean, I know him in like Drive and stuff like that, but do you think other people still see him as uh, yeah, he's, he's kind of a the very notebook or whatever it was? He's a well-known underground leading man. I know he's picky about his roles, and he doesn't like taking high-profile stuff usually. Yeah, this is the only one he picked. He this is the only one he's a blockbuster he's chosen to lead or star in, and that was because of how impressed he was with the script and who all was involved in uh, Roger Deakins's. uh, Did La La Land not count? La La that that was was after this. That was an. But still. But also, you have to consider that uh, at the uh, musicals have been kind of not crazy popular. These Although days, that so. won uh, quite a few Oscars, if I remember. Oh yeah, correctly. it did. The thing yeah, is that because it was, was that. a feat. That movie was low, lower budgeted. It doesn't look low budget, but it is lower budgeted. So let's talk about the sequel prospects. This movie does leave a couple of loose ends. Uh, we don't know what happens to Wallace after this. Yeah, so. I was thinking that. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. There's, there's. Well, I want him gone. Part of me the almost thing... didn't know for sure if Kay was dead or not the first time I saw it. But yes, it also my... leaves that kind of open as well. I don't. It says in the Wikipedia article that he he is a mortal wound, but he doesn't actually seem to die just yet. As far as I can tell, based on the story. It feels as if that's the conclusion of his character. Yeah. When I watched it, I watched it and rewinded it and watched and watched. And I do feel like there was a moment where he did ever so slightly tilt his head back a little bit more and like intentionally stop breathing. I need that eye dilation. 
<laughs> the thing, the thing is, if if I if you watch another one and he's still alive, one part of me is going to be happy, but the other part is, well, that's not going to be true to well, the last story. We talked about it last episode, and it, it's similar to again the top in Inception. Yeah, there was talk of possibly pressing forward and doing a sequel. That talk is still up in the air. It's not. This is not a confirmed dead franchise. It's dormant. Uh, so Ridley Scott has expressed interest in returning to the story. He's has some ideas as to where it could go. And he was involved uh, in this, right? He was executive producer. Yes, he was a producer. He was going to direct it, but he got caught up directing Alien Covenant, uh, which I'm kind of glad he kept his hands more off of this one. I agree. Uh, as much yeah, as I like Ridley Scott. Yeah, Ridley Scott's a great director. I feel like New Blood with a respect to the original is what this needed though as evidenced by prometheus and alien covenant which were directed by ridley scott who also directed alien those movies are fine but i don't think they are masterpieces like alien is right um but yeah and even more recently denis villanueve actually came out and said he would love to revisit the blade runner universe but it would be with completely different characters on a completely different part of the world or maybe on a different world uh so he that's out in the world now he he has some interest in returning to this franchise it just would be with the caveat of i can't we can't do any of these legacy characters anymore i can appreciate that yeah and i like that too yeah and i hope that they don't because you know you risk tarnishing the reputation and the whole image of the franchise if you put something out there as a cash grab and ruin it yeah Uh, The movie also does leave a slight loose end with the replicants. They're trying to start this rebellion or kick off this war, and it's still this inevitable thing that hasn't happened. No, that leads into Terminator. Yeah, (laughs) exactly. (laughs) To be fair, though, that's one of those uh, storylines that can be uh, left to your mind, you know. Yeah, I think that the main character's point is to this is his story and there are other things happening around him as in any real life situation, you don't get to see the fruition of all those stories. Yeah. You just kind of pass the baton and it moves on to another. Uh, yeah. To name it, to name an example of a story that uh, has a war or whatever continuation afterwards that is to be left to your mind. Um, Les Mis is actually a story like that where, they don't fully go into the uh, French War, but they do the prelude to it, sort of, and at the end, it's pretty much clear-cut. Okay, mm-hmm. they're gonna, there's going to be a war. There's going to be a revolution. Okay. So it's kind of like that. Well, we have history to look it, at for that. I mean, true, but uh, but the thing is, you know, you essentially know what's going to happen, so they don't really have to show that it's going to happen. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. It's a focus on these people's lives versus the overall macro right. picture. Yeah. All right, and that leads me into our franchise talk. There is another movie in this franchise, I guess you can say. But we're we're going <laughs> to go ahead and still make a make a ruling on this one. Uh so if this were to be the last film in this franchise, which even reg- even in regards to the other one that exists in this franchise or People argue does and doesn't. Well, I'd say this Would one this... comes later chronology anyway, so it's... Yes. So is this a dishonorable death or an honorable oh. death for Blade Runner? If this were to be the final film, can this stand on its own as a story, or does it need a sequel? This is the most honorable death <laughs> we've had. Yes. It can honor. definitely stand alone. Hon- I, don't honor. Think there's, I don't think there's much question. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's an honorable death for this one yeah. for me as well. How about you, AJ? Oh, yeah. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, unanimous. That wasn't much of a question. So, (laughs) if Blade Blade Runner were to... Blade Runner were to (laughs) move on. Thanks, guys. (laughs) If Blade Runner were to carry on, or not carry on after this, it would be perfectly fine as is. Preserved, and it's perfect. Chrysalis. <laughs> I would this implies a butterfly. Or yes, a next moth. It's prever- preserved. <laughs> <laughs> I I think okay. that I would not so, be happy hey. if they tried to remake this and butchered it in any way. When you have a ten for ten movie, I don't know if I like 
Uh, or do remake it and butcher it and just emphasize how good this movie is. I guess. I just, but, I mean, I mentioned Terminator for a reason because yeah. that whole revolution thing gave off a Terminator vibe for me. And I feel like it would go down the Terminator route, which obviously we would say is not the best. Yeah, uh, we don't from want what that. We had, you know, the first. Although I'd two. love to talk Terminator at yeah, some point. Yeah, I would too. Yeah, but it's still going, isn't it? No, it's it's. I think it's definitely it? dormant or dead after Terminator Dark Fate. Well, well, and then they had the whole Sarah Connor series, and I mean, it was just like kind of all over the place. Yeah. All right, that closes out our Blade Runner 2049 episode. We're doing number a crunch. Beast. Uh, oh, yeah. Next so, uh, week, let me calculate the numbers real quick. Oh yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Cr- crunch our numbers. I, I have a guess that this 10, might be our 10, number one it is, movie. It is <laughs> without a doubt. We all have ten. Oh, Except, carry those yeah, we all four. Get it I know, no. <laughs> yeah, really make sure you have the number right. Repeating, of course. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, so we have Divide a total average pie. of ten, obviously. Um, if was you've been paying a, attention. And, was that uh, a Leroy yes, Jenkins quote, or yeah, it was. And then, uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right, all that right, puts it squarely at our number one overall franchise here, just Woo, behind um, yes. Neverending Story two. Ew. All right. Sounds good to <laughs> me. <laughs> Story two. Go away. <sighs> Guys, awesome. this has been, this has been an episode. Oh yeah, yeah I'm I'm, I'm ready to get to simpler times though. After this, where it's just we can trash on something or just because the research i've had to do for these and just the amount of like just how much i have to pay attention to every single thing that i'm watching <laughs> has been rough uh, but i love it i love it well but also <laughs> all i know is that you guys need to catch us next time where we do nothing but a 30 minute uh take uh with noah doing hand puppets reenacting the entire movie but he hates puppets I hate puppets. Uh, yeah, but you're the one doing the puppets. <laughs> puppets so it's playing okay. chess. <laughs> oh, <Yeah>. no. <laughs> That's my nightmares. Knight, <laughs> queen takes bishop. All right, so, uh, Reese, what's, uh, what, what do we cover that. next week? Next week, we're talking about Paul W.S. Anderson's Soldier, starring Kurt Russell. <laughs> we all know it. <laughs> Came out in the mid-'90s. It's technically in the Blade Runner universe, and there's actually some a slight call-out to that movie in Blade Runner 2049. What? For eagle-eyed viewers, it's uh, some sort of... There's a item or some sort of uh, contraption that is uh, a more, I don't know, advanced version of something from Soldier. I don't remember specifically what it is, but it's there, so there is a certain acknowledgement of Soldier's existence in Blade Runner 2049. Which is insane. So it we're gonna we're gonna talk about it just for fun because I think we need something that's not as heavy, and that we can. We need some dumb in our lives. There's <laughs> only one play, one way to go down from here. Or, I, hey, well, but let's give it an honest shot. We'll give it an honest shot. We're gonna go in with an open mind. I've never. I don't think any of us have ever seen this movie. Right? Ready for an hour and a half? Are you of serious? Thursday, I own guys? like five copies of it. <laughs> okay. Uh, DVD and VHS and Betamax, and... Laserdisc. Yeah. <laughs> Ultra HD. Uh, all right. That is the end of our episode. Stay tuned for Soldier, starring Kurt Russell. You can find us on Spotify, Podbean, Instagram. Mm-hmm. You want? Yeah, please do go on there and uh, hit me up. Yeah. Did I say Apple? Uh, no, you didn't. Apple. Stitcher. Stitcher. Other places. Good, Google. Just, just look us up. You'll find us. Yeah. If you like Franchise soundtracks, check like out it. our uh, playlist for some select tracks from our movies here on Spotify, yes. YouTube, uh, coming to title soon, hopefully. So, Woo. <laughs> all right, goodbye, guys. Bye. Bye. I do hope you're satisfied with our product.